Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey, welcome to the Team House, uh, episode 218. Uh, I'm Dave Park, here with Jack Murphy, who has been taking, like, some stairway. No, with our uh, special guest host, uh, Andy Milburn, and our guest tonight is uh, Steve Forti. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, so, anyway, let's get started. Sorry, I'm, my computer wasn't on silent. Um, Steve, please uh, tell us about your origin story. What's your background and what led you into the military? Yeah, well, uh, first off, thank you so much for having uh, me. I was laughing myself on the way in here uh, because I was thinking to myself, all the really awesome guests must be away this weekend and uh, <laughs> traveling for the fourth. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, so what got me in the military, um, you know, a set of different life circumstances. And I was never that kid that had set out or planned to go into the military. And I, I wasn't um, the kid that even played G.I. Joe in the backyard, truly. Um, as uh, Chris Miller had kind of said, you know, uh, on, on, on the show that I listened to. the um, I came from sort of a, a, a hesitant uh, family when it came to the military because of my father's story. And my father was someone that went into the Marine Corps when he was 17 years old. Um, Vietnam era, was severely wounded in Da Nang uh, in Vietnam in 1965 and spent uh, the rest of his life paying for that. He you know, was severely burned and severely injured, um, traumatic brain injury, the whole works. He had 70% body surface area burns, the poor guy, and um, then would you know, die at the age of 40 from cancer from Agent Orange. <clears throat> so we were not you know, this family that we were always patriotic and everyone served in World War II uh, and everyone served in Korea if they were of the appropriate age, but it wasn't something that was necessarily on my, um, on, on my horizon. And then when my father did pass away, um, I, I was stuck in that place of not being able to afford to, co afford to continue to go into school and uh, not really understanding like, okay, what's my next move? What's my next step? So after a short stint where I was living up in Boston, I was going to Northeastern University. And when I was living up in Boston, I got a job at uh, a bar and was having a really healthy social life uh, that was absolutely going nowhere. Thankfully, <laughs> I recognized it pretty early. And I uh, got on a train in Boston uh, and I went to the recruiter on Trumbull Street in New Haven. And I went to New Haven just because I had to get some ID. I had to get paperwork to actually do that. And I uh, and I enlisted from there. Was your, you know, given your father's experiences, especially like the Agent Orange and things like that, and you know the government's lack of acknowledgement of that was was he at all like anti-military or just kind of anti-service because yeah. of that because and of Vietnam and whatnot? <laughs> I'm just surprised you got to that question so quickly. Um, no. And that was the shocking thing about it, because what had actually happened is I was 18 years old. I had my documents. I went and I enlisted and I didn't ask and I didn't tell anybody. And then I kind of went to him dishonestly, like asking for permission, you know, even though I had already kind of done it. And I barely got the words out where I'd said to him, like, hey, I just want to let you know, I'm really giving this some consideration, you know. And uh, <clears throat> he said, it's up for every young man to decide the capacity in which he will serve his country. Great way to put it. And it landed, and I said to him, I was like, well, and I, I want to be honest with you. And I told him, and he said, well, I knew that when you asked me to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so it was sort of this Damn, interesting this interplay. Parental presence. It was good, and it, you know, what was, it was a gift um, that I, re I think I realized what a gift that was more now than I did at the time. Mm -hmm. I knew it was awesome. I was like, wow, my dad was great about that. Yeah. But when you think about it, like here's a guy living in like eight out of 10 pain, right? 24 seven, right. burned. He is ill and you know, I didn't know the mm -hmm. truth at the time, but they were giving him 15, 20% for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You know, so here he is. And the fact that he could give that gift of like, because he could have easily, and I don't think anybody would have faulted him. No, yeah. easily just been like, 
I did this for the for this generation. Like you got, and if he had said to me no, I don't know that I would have pushed past it. Yeah. In fairness to yourself, too, I mean, we we had this awesome com- conversation beforehand, uh, but but the fact you know, I'd be interested to hear your your chain your decision your decision chain wasn't that irresponsible, right? Because you didn't join the Marine Corps, you felt that that <laughs> yeah. was that was perhaps out of bounds, and know? that was deliberate because um, you know his experience was so different. And even I got to tell you, even when um, he was at his sickest, never once did he waver in his commitment to the country or to the core. Mm. I never actually saw him complain about cancer or the pain or whatever it was. He never said I got screwed or none of it, you know, but there was sort of, as we had talked about before, it felt too far because I think we all want to be like our dads to some degree. And then at the same time, we don't want to be anything like them at times. Mm -hmm. But I think there was part of me that would have liked to have had that avenue to have said like you and I had this one shared experience because we didn't get along. We truly didn't. Um, So to have this one shared thing of both going through the core or whatever, but it did feel wrong. You know, it it did feel wrong to me. It felt like it would have stung too much. Mm. And I don't know if it would have or not. If it did, he certainly wouldn't have showed it. Uh, I don't know. But I I made my choice for for the military and I told him was the desire to go to Special Forces to become a Green Beret. And... I didn't know this at the time. I didn't know the history, but when he was in Vietnam, he had come across a lot of contract type people and a lot of Green Berets that were already there mm-hmm. for years. And uh, he said, it's smart, you'll have autonomy. Now, autonomy is a relative thing, sure. but there was truth in what he said. Mm-hmm. You know, He's like, you're not just a number. It was sort of the- it's, it's a relative thing if you're in the Marine Corps, everyone's got autonomy. <laughs> right. but, but yeah, if, uh, absolutely. Uh, the way just one word he summed up beautifully. Do you remember a lot of false recon guys gone out to yeah. go to 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 become Green Berets? And when you are, and it, I suppose this was during the nineties, you know, right mm-hmm. around the same time that that you know, you're in, Steve. A lot of guys were getting out, and when you asked them that question, they wouldn't sum it up as as well as your father did. But it came down to that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Hey, listen, I'm a bright guy. I've got a future ahead of me. I've I've enjoyed my time in the Marine Corps, but. I'm not necessarily but I want treated somebody like to treat me like a grown yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you're so that's a, that's a that's very interesting to hear your father make that observation back then, as a kid. Yeah, you know, right. Like he was, was a kid when he saw it. So yeah, he was probably looking at 24 yeah. and 25 year old seasoned combat guys, <laughs> yeah. Mac V Sog. You know. So uh, did awesome. you enlist uh, on the 18 X ray or no? So I went. Um, they didn't have. I didn't know about the 18 X ray, and I um. Went into the regular infantry. Okay. And uh, my plan was actually to, to do this, go into the regular infantry, and then like maybe an ROTC scholarship and back to college and, you know, fulfill that sort of path that had just been part of my existence since I was a kid. Like you, in the 90s, you got a liberal arts education from a college university. You, you know, paid the tuition, you went, and that was sort of the rite of passage. So I never thought there was another path or another way. You know, I didn't even know there was this thing, especially from Connecticut. And we had no, we were not from any type of affluence whatsoever. We were actually fairly poor. Um, again, relative. But um, I never thought that there would be this military service piece. I never thought there would be anything but working towards completing a degree. So I went into the reserves and um, with the idea of going to ROTC. And my father passed and I, uh, while all that was happening. And then I... Um, heard about a uh, LRS unit in Rhode Island. It was a Airborne National Guard unit. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, that sounds a lot cooler than being in the infantry. So I went up one day, I met with the recruiter, and I drove. And as I was driving up, there was a sign. It was at Camp Fogarty up in Rhode Island. And it said, like, A Company, 19th Special, uh, this is A Company, 2nd and 19th Special Forces Group. And I just kept driving. <laughs> and I just literally drove up to the gate. And I, I mean, the story must have been hysterical because I, like, walked in and I was like, you know, I want to find out about this and become special forces you could do that and you know of course there was some ball busting when i go in where it's like hey we're looking for a uh, 19 year old non-pldc non-airborne non-selection right right right. (laughs) like oh my god here's the royal carpet sir can you drive (laughs) yeah exactly um so there was that but then they um agreed and i i was a very good uh i don't want to say i was a good athlete I i was a very fit and strong person 
um, athletes involve skill, of like <laughs> shooting things with balls and making points. Um, and I was more, a little bit more on the knuckle dragging side of that, you know. So um, I uh, found this this place at the right time, and uh, committed to moving into the special forces program. So when you enlisted, you went. Like, where did you initially go? Fort Benning, Georgia. So you went to Fort Benning yeah. for the infantry, one station unit training or whatever? Yeah, I went to OSIT at uh, Sand Hill. And then what unit did you end up at? So I was with 3rd 35th Infantry Unit when I got back, and I was there literally. So this is during the Clinton age. Mm -hmm. And we literally heard we were getting cut in, like, five months. Like, all the reduction in forces and rifts. So I was already out looking for it. I tried to assess onto active duty to Ranger Battalion, and there was a block on transitioning from reserves or national guard onto active duty okay so okay right so there was yeah. no active duty option for me right. yeah, yeah there was no anything so it was like yeah. what's the most mm -hmm. i could do and somebody had told me they're like you know if you get special forces qualified you could then possibly assess onto active duty right so i was like okay now we're kind of moving in the right direction a bit i still had no money for college i wasn't interested in college i right. wasn't so um i within a very short time i don't even know if i got issued my gear from the third 35th reserve unit and then transferred into the national guard in rhode island and went through um their pre-assessment and selection program yeah. and what really moved it along for me is um they gave me this list of things that i had to do and you're gonna laugh at one of them because we're all old enough i think but we had this list of like our physicals and our mmpi and our uh, you know all of the different things requirements that we needed and um i was the only one that had them all done so a slot popped up to go to selection and it was sort of like probably not going to make it but we'll send you anyway and uh you're at least going to learn what to train for for when you go back in a couple years what in what year was this 92. so that was was that about the time when they were making all the reserve units guard units yes and then so there was still the reserve component they right. weren't taking anybody else in because i actually called up to the 11 special forces group up at devons and they weren't taking anybody in their ranks were full anyway because they had 10th group up at devons at the time and they were just backfilling they right. were at a surplus right you know so they weren't really looking for it but we started seeing guys trickle from that unit down to the national guard and we were sort of wondering what's going on and i think there was a simultaneous standing up of the civil affairs where some senior SF guys were finding their E8 slot and E7 yeah. slot, yeah. you know? That continued for a while. Yeah, so there was sort of this weird shuffle going on, but what there was plenty of slots where it was like junior Bravos and junior Camo guys and junior Deltas, you know? And um, so I got to go to selection and try out, and uh, I made it, you know? And um, the thing that was the difference at the time was... Of all the things, like some people had their physicals, some people had their psych, some people had other stuff. A lot of people were hesitant on the electronic funds transfer, the direct deposit. Oh, interesting. Everybody wanted their physical Amazing. check still. And yeah. I think I was like the new adopter. Yeah. And that became like a prereq at that moment. Yeah. So even though there were guys with more seniority that were waiting for the selection date before me, I was literally the one person they could send. And they, I think they did it and probably like held their nose like, oh, God, like this, he's not ready, whatever. Um, so it gave me my shot. And uh, I, I was smart enough, I think, to Curiously enough, that, that one discriminator probably was not random. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they, <laughs> you, right, right. you had the prescience. <laughs> right. you know, this is going to be a thing. <laughs> yeah, I felt that way. I'm going to follow the money. Yeah. And I was like, well, if an E8 gives me a checklist of things to knock out and says these are requirements i didn't read into it like it was yeah. Yeah, yeah, today yeah. where you'd be like well is this a real requirement or yeah. is this a you know sort of a that's amazing how because i was in a guard unit an sf guard unit around that time and i was there for two years and myself and the guys that i was with none of us got to sfas like it was there was a huge backlog of people that just it was taking forever to Are get there. you still there. insisting on a hard check? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yes. Smoking gun. Um, yeah. I was. I mean, I went to like... Actually, cash on demand. Uh, so I went to PLDC in January. I went to Airborne in March. I went to Selection in April and the Q course in June. That's fantastic. Wow. It was literally... So it was almost... It was as close to a Rep yeah. 63. Yeah. Uh, Rep 63 was the guard program, they called it back then, for the 18X-ray equivalent. 
Uh, so I was as mm. close to that as I could possibly get. So within two years of enlisting, I was a very young. You were there back there. I was, uh, I was not legal to drink, or I was just legal to drink when I graduated the Q course. Yeah, that's fantastic. I was a little bit so older. So it worked um, out. So what? Uh, you got there and you, you became a Bravo. Did you choose that, or was that chosen for you? I mistakenly thought it was valuable, <laughs> <laughs> not knowing, you know, like medic or commo right. is infinitely more valuable. I think I also looked at, I was like, could always reclass, but this one's six months. It's short, yeah. Right, and then, so, I mean, it was the, the core curriculum piece, right? The whole thing was still 11 months or so, but the core piece of it was like that five or six month academics versus the Delta course, which was 11 or 12 yeah. months. So I was like, let me get this done, let me get tab. You can always reclass up. And I think somebody gave me that advice now that I'm saying it out loud. I think somebody was like, you can always reclass. So I went to the, the, Bravo, <laughs> the Bravo course and uh, met some fantastic humans that were um, kind enough to mentor me in the direction of talking less <laughs> and uh, managed to, to get through the Q course at a pretty young age. Oh, now were you like the youngest guy in your, I was the youngest guy for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And then not long after me, there was a kid that came in through Utah through the rep 63 program, mm -hmm. whose father was like a Colonel or a general or something, which is the way he got the, the contract. And then he broke the, the, the record by like 10 months. But prior to me, it was a long time before somebody at that age had made it through the Q course. There was uh, three waivers I needed. I needed an age waiver, and I needed a time in service and a time in grade waiver. So I had to get all three waivers. And um It'd be interesting to see the demographic for the Q course over the years, you know, what the mean age is. Yeah. You know, I've, I've always thought one of the, I mean, obviously you had the emotional intelligence, that's what carried you through. I always thought one of the strengths of Army SF was the fact that they were taking older guys in. Yeah. You know, who and and not not a necessary correlation, but you tend to get that a little bit more of let someone who's a little <coughs> more judicious. Um but but anyway, it, it so the Marine Corps kind of copied that in Marsoc. Mm -hmm. they, they absolutely they they said, I want that dynamic. And we've ended up with a demographic um I when when I was regimental commander, about thirty, you know, thirty two was was the average guy in Marsoc, but I didn't look at the, you know, the average age of guys coming in. But it'd be interesting to see yeah. for the Q course yeah. what that's been and what what they've learned from that over yeah. the years. And when do you think you're useful, right? Like, so you yeah. finish the training, exactly. You cut yeah. your teeth on a few deployments. Like, you're probably from the time you finish that level of training, you're probably three to four years away from being. Uh, a um, balancing, stabilizing, effective force on the team. Yeah, that's a great point too. I wonder what others yeah. think. And there's many people more knowledgeable oh, than I am. But, but, but I. But the way that the Army and the Marine Corps does this, though, I, I would, you know, they're not taking in newbies. And I'm not doing a comparison with services. But one of the problems, and not one of the problems, but you know, it's a very different demographic in the SEAL and yeah. NSW. You get kids who come in through buds. Army and the Marine Corps, SF. So, in, so in other words, I, I, I don't know enough to, to disagree with you, um, but I think probably the rationale would be, hey, hey, this guy may be a newbie on the team, but he's already done two, three combat deployments sure. as a Marine NCO or a, an Army NCO. Yeah. Or had you know. a career before he enlisted it, exactly, where he had yeah. to show up for work every day like an adult and take yeah. care of his affairs. You know, people don't understand the administrative necessity. Yeah. And I think, I, I don't know if it's worse now or then. Now it's a little bit more automated, but like, you know, keeping and maintaining a security clearance mm -hmm. yeah. was far more challenging back then, right? And then like you could lose it for a number of different yeah. ways. Like in North Carolina, you could you lose speeding your security tickets. clearance. Speeding tickets. Drunk, if you if someone drove your car and you were in the car inebriated and they were inebriated, you would get your security yeah. clearance revoked. You got a ticket. You got the same DUI or DWI that wow. they did. So there was a number yeah. of different, even the threat of any domestic issue whatsoever, your security yeah, clearance is getting suspended. And there was not a single billet within all of SOF that you could be there without, I'm sure it's yeah. still that way today, where it's yeah. like you couldn't even be a, a, an instructor somewhere without a yeah. yeah, Yeah, uh, real quick, I just want to give a shout out to our sponsors. Uh, first off, uh, 
the light sweeper. Um, unfortunately, we don't have it because uh, Jack took it for his camping trip. That's how amazing it is. But uh, okay, this gonna I'm gonna put you on spot. What uh, what's the greatest invention or the the only piece of gear in the military? The whoopee. The whoopee, right? The light sleeper is the ultimate whoopee. It's something I wish I had had. Um, but our friend Dustin Ward, who's been on the show, uh, former Ranger, um, created this great whoopee based um, containment system that holds your sleeping mat in place, has a spot for a pillow. Uh, it's it's the ultimate whoopee. And the whoopee is the ultimate piece of military quit, kit. I highly, highly recommend it. it. It's rated for like 40 degrees, only weighs a couple pounds, uh, fits into a great snug pack. Check it out. Um, you'll love it. Great for sleepovers too. Uh, but go to the lightsleeper.com. Uh, uh, use the team house. Oh, hit the link for the... Do you know what the code is on that? I know the link is in the description. for L-I-T-E. L-I-T-E sleeper.com. Team house for 10% off. Yeah, but the link's in the description of both the show notes and the video description. And uh, our other sponsor tonight um, is AARP Veteran Report. We had Toby uh, on the show a, a couple times now. And Toby is, the, uh, I believe, the editor-in-chief or the chief editor. Yeah. Um, but the AARP veteran talk point is a great, even if you're not in AARP, like some of us, <clears throat> um, it's, it is, you know, they don't spam you. It's, they're great articles. Um, you know, they're patriotic, but not super raw, raw, but they do human interest. Uh, like my hero, they do just great articles about the veteran community. Um, you know, the veteran retire community and the veteran community in general, great for, uh, you know, for. I don't want to say tips and tricks, but for things that are important to veterans, it's free. You won't get spammed. We love the people who put this out. Uh, it's well curated and a nice balance of light stuff and some items that are serious. So check out um, AARP Veteran uh, Report. That's aarp.org slash vet report. Um, check it out, guys. It's free. I, there aren't many free things in this world. Also, please like and subscribe to our channel. It really helps us out. We're on that march to 100,000 to show that we're legitimate YouTubers. Um, so give us a go. Um, That's the thing I said, the march to 100,000. It, it's, it's, it's a march. You guys are what, like 79K right 79K now? 79K right now. Solid. So when you, when you hit 100,000... Uh, the, the dynamics change as far as looking for sponsors and well uh, it, and i mean it it helps the algorithm a lot like yeah. it, it youtube takes us more seriously so when people are searching for you know our topics they come up in searches um it just it helps all around so healthy and we get a cool plaque which i know jack really covered coats. <laughs> you know it, it's interesting because talking about special forces guard and talking about age, you know, when special forces. Would <laughs> what do you point to me when you say? That? <laughs> well, no, you were talking about the age of special forces. Oh yeah, yeah. Not that you're. Right. I don't think no, you're. It's... Um, I think you're very young, Annie. Um, but you know, when special forces were first started, it was that, you know, bring in these people with, uh, you know, professional experience. You know, electricians and sure. plumbers and people from other countries who spoke languages and, and whatnot, right? I mean, I think that was yeah. had a lot to do with the origin. And, you know, you, we lost a little bit of that, I think, you know, as Special Forces became more under Big Army and, and, and things mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, where you do lose sort of that age and life experience, the Guard is an interesting place because, yeah. you know, a person in Special Forces can have they can still develop those they'll, they'll they're bringing outside experiences into this unit um and while they may not practice shooting moving and communicating every single day so many of the other skills that are hard to develop a lot of times guys in the guard bring those skills yeah it's it, i think it's our greatest strength as a guard soft element right and we'll take um I, I don't want to use his last name, but we had a guy on my team named Keith, and uh, he, one of my best friends. He's one of my brothers. But now here's a guy that could take apart any diesel engine and put it together. 
Now you think like, well, what good is that? Well, if you're on a fob in Wardock province and you need to keep the lights on and that's how the batteries are getting charged for the radios, then being able to run a diesel generator is a critical thing as well as operate a forklift. He could weld, he was a true wrench turner. And I've learned, I learned so much by just being in proximity to him that I've now applied to my mm -hmm. life here as an adult, uh -huh. right? And, and that's one aspect. We had a gentleman named Mark on my team who was a, a detective and we were standing up the AP3 program in Afghanistan in 2009, which was essentially a police force. Okay, who better than to structure, organize, and train people how to search, or train us how to train people how to search? Which, as we know, you know, the, I don't know if the audience knows, uh, most of them probably do, but you know, Green Berets are essentially, you know, trainers that, you know, fight with a partnered nation force. But you train them before you move with them, and in a lot of these you know, conflicts, not to get too class witsy in here, but, you know, you're looking for military guns facing outward, but there has to be a law enforcement gun facing inward or democracies fall mm -hmm. or attempts at any organization. Well, in, government. in Afghanistan, that was a, that became a rule. That was reality. Yeah. Of it, right. So we, we were, we launched the pilot for the AP3 program uh, uh, in 2009. Uh, out of Metro Lab. and that was our mission over there and you know a lot of guys like you said you first of all a lot of guys shrugged off the mission They're like oh I can't believe it we want to be with the commandos kicking and door right we had passports to go outside the wire every second mm -hmm. we wanted to like we had no restrictions whatsoever we can grab a partner force element we could go out we could do presence patrols we could knock on doors we were in a true community type environment so when it comes to things like community interaction and intelligence gathering and things like that you couldn't beat it and it's only in an SF team that's nationally guard dominant that you're going to have individuals. Like I was a critical, so I was an 18 Bravo and a level one sniper at that point in time. But I was also a, a critical care nurse, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. certified with mm -hmm. significant experience for airway management test tubes. Now we had a, two amazing 18 Deltas on our team. Right. But then to have a third sort of delta that could certainly stabilize and yeah. certainly mm -hmm. get line IV access and certainly could trach mm -hmm. or crike somebody if mm -hmm. I needed to. You know, so there's those hidden skills that mm -hmm. you get in a guard element, that civilian force. And, you know, lastly, if we look at the importance of that civilian citizen soldier over our history, if you look at the numbers from World War yeah. Two, it has always been a part from our country's origin. You know, mm -hmm. if there's any question, go see Hamilton. And, and and it's dangerous if it's not. You know, I'm, some of my concern, <laughs> some of my concern, frankly, is we have a class of warriors mm -hmm. that is separate from mainstream American society. I'm not bemoaning that. I'm just wondering right now if it's healthy. Mm. You know, even during Vietnam, what what ended Vietnam was the fact that everyone faced the prospect of going there. Yeah. Right. It may have been a shitty, useless experience, yeah. but it was shared. Afghanistan right. and Iraq were not shared, right? You know, so I, I, I mean, this isn't that's me interesting, out, yeah. But, but I, I, the way you word it, I think is is from is a much better way. You know, it's rather than us saying, oh, well, you know, why doesn't everyone give a shit? Well, they don't give a shit because it isn't a universal experience. What you're talking about is the value that that universal experience brings both ways yeah. into the military but also bleeding back into society because yeah. of that feeling of shared experience it also increases the footprint or you know the um i guess let's call it a spider web because what used to be like well my son served he did three years down at fort bragg and now he's out and he comes back to a certain part of the community okay that's one scenario but when National Guard units are deploying from all over the country, the likelihood of you knowing the son or daughter of someone yeah. that's actively serving, yeah, right. sort of on loop over yeah. a two-decade war, it brings it a little bit closer to home. And I always thought, like, you know, regardless of what you feel politically, I think at this point in time, we're done with war yep. as a nation, mm. right? Without weighing in my own beliefs or anything, I think as a nation, they're kind of like, can we pump the brakes on the wars? Right. Can we pump the yeah. brakes on sending people overseas? Can we pump the brakes on lives lost? And can we just focus that that energy inward a bit? Right. You know? Yeah. And you're seeing it with charity involvement. You're seeing it yeah. with community involvement. You're seeing with this need to be more connected. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's you know, it, that, that's absolutely true. One, one thing that you mentioned about sort of that, that group think or that not necessarily group think, but sort of the insular community. I, it's one of the 
you know, arguments for ROTC also, right? Yeah. That you don't just want, you know, you want people who are coming from many different backgrounds. Getting a in, taste of it. Getting a taste of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not everybody going through the academy. And, yeah, I think that we, we definitely have war fatigue at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, I think the veterans are an important voice to that where a, a lot of veterans are like, hey, like, we just did 20 years with no measurable consequence or no measurable effect. Can we think about this before yeah. we go into the next one? Yeah. There's, a, there's another element of something Steve was talking about. It's got me thinking that the, and, and I see this in Marine Reservists too, the enlisted guys. There's, I'm not, yeah, I love Marines, you know, was, but Marines can be scary after a period of time in the fact that, you know, you could take an 18 year old and you put him in this particular life mm -hmm. and he stays that all his adult life mm -hmm. and God bless him, he's going to be, and you put him to, you know, re repeated cycles of going to war, you don't always get a terrific human being at the end. You get, I mean, underneath, you get a guy you can right. trust, you can tell anything to, you know, I'm not saying he goes, hey, he isn't a wife, Peter, isn't that, but he's not necessarily a guy you want to spend a lot of time with because he has issues and we've created those issues. But one thing I've noticed among reservists and, and I'll, you know, I don't, no, not to sidetrack the story, the best officer I ever met in my life, and it pains me to say this because I'm a Marine, it was a 20th group guy. What made him different is he had done all this other shit. He'd been a coal miner. He'd worked for Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was a Hollywood scriptwriter for Christ's sake. Uh -huh. And I learned a ton from that guy. I had way more time in the military, but he could teach me how to be an officer. And I thought about this a lot, you know, and yeah. um, how he could do that. A lot of it was his personality, his character, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of it was just he Life took the experience. experiences that he had. Yeah. And every day it was almost like, hey, dude, what we do here isn't that hard. <laughs> you know right it's <laughs> and what's interesting about what you say is we talk about this with the transition piece right first of all i think transitioning out of the military is the worst damn word like we don't uh, use yeah. that to describe any other aspect of right. it. like yeah. i'm I transitioning agree. out of singlehood or right. i'm transitioning out of not having children like right. we don't use that so i don't understand how maybe that be became. calm i'm transitioning right. out of this marriage or thing. did you like we We're didn't transitioning leave, right? out of singlehood yeah. right? i'm we gonna use that right <laughs> and we didn't leave our civilian world in transition so yeah. so i don't know and i was literally talking about it with the my brother like a jc gleck he's like a brother to me it's to call my friend as a, a an understatement and he um we just had shared a linkedin post and i seldom do but i just was actually responded to a post this morning where like these aspects of changing life which i've reinvented myself more times than most right yeah but these aspects of changing like we can label them as these things but isn't at the end of the day like wouldn't it be better for everybody if we just called it like growth yeah. change like yeah. you know you're leaving the military and you're not in, in this mm. idea that there's no measurable skill set and i hear this all the time like i have no transferable skill sets like your skill set in the military as cool as it isn't is not your ability to put rounds on target there is an entire other host of support efforts, administrative responsibilities, yeah. leadership tasks, responsibilities, different things that go into leadership, being a warrior. Leadership is a hard, hard skill. It is. Take it. And to say like, oh, I, I, you know, he's getting out and we have to help these people transition yeah. into it because they don't have measurable skill. We have to retrain them. It's fiction. Yeah. in my book it, i i love that statement i wish we, yeah yeah i, I uh, well it's being recorded so we can yeah, yeah. use I'm chat bt well, and have it all read that is Steve, yeah if i can't claim it was mine but i love it you, you can claim it. yeah i've i've always like disagreed with the idea of transitioning like when you leave you have to reinvent yourself like there's no that was something that you did um but and and i think when you talk about the measurable skill that's also a challenge if somebody for somebody who hasn't necessarily worked in the civilian world. And it's also a challenge for civilians for recognizing what not just a, you know, a, a colonel or, you know, captain bring in terms of leading people, but, you know, a young NCO, uh, the circumstances under which, which they led people, whether it's in combat or in a, like a high volume supply room, right? A high volume supply chain that it's, it's, you know, there are a lot of people out there, a lot of veterans, I think, that are really trying to help with this idea of, one, 
veterans being able to describe, you know, their jobs and their their skills in a way civilians understand and two civilians, you know, mm -hmm. try, they're trying to train civilians how to understand that what this person brings to the table. But it's very, you know, it it can be it can seem like a square peg in a round hole, but it's really mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. But I am the direct beneficiary of a bit of luck and having my path cross with I can name more but I'll say like four extraordinary people at HSS so I had success when I got out of the military I started my own company and some more successful some personal success and financially not but I, I was happy with the effort and the end state you know um, and then when COVID hit you know, a, a dear friend that I had done some work with who was not in the military um, reached out to me to, to come in and assist with some crisis management at HSS as they transformed the hospital into a COVID treatment facility. And uh, I got the call from him, and this would lead to a cascade of phone calls to... Can we... I, I don't want to... Yeah. I don't want to stop this. you, but I also want to... I don't want to get too far ahead... Let um we'll can we go back to <laughs> sure. um your your time in the guard yeah and what was that like for you being and and I definitely want to hear about yeah, eight, absolutely um H, uh, HSS um it, but we're that's many moons down the road you're a young very young long tabber eighteen Bravo now mm -hmm. what does it look like when you show up to your team um. We had a weird dynamic on the, on the team that I was at, and, and not weird in a negative way. So we had some um, guys that actually are still my friends today who their first team sergeant and sergeant major were Vietnam era Mac V SA guys. We had guys in Bad Tulse, Germany with 10th group, yeah, you know, in the 80s. And that's how they were cut. And one of my, you know, again, I'm, I'm blessed with, when I keep saying one of my closest friends, they're all as a result of the military. Um, but, you know, um, one of my friends, Mike, is a, you know, Bad Tulse 10th guy before they shut it down. Mm -hmm. And he carried the legacy of the Green Beret like it was. Like it should be actually like like he understood that his mission was not cool guy door kicking in Oakley's. He understood his mission was a force multiplier, training the force, and he instilled that right. So we had those individuals. We had the same individuals with like fifth group guys that their guys were Vietnam. So we had those mm -hmm. individuals right that had that stratification from the Vietnam era to their early formation right and then they were now in these mid-level and senior level leadership in the 90s when i joined the team so when i reflect on it you know when the cringing and the the chills i have of embarrassment on the back of my neck for some of the things i said and did at the time subside right you realize like there was a great deal of um patience and decency and mentorship and professionalism mentorship to the degree that i didn't even know was happening at the time mm -hmm. and some of it was military but a lot of it was this personal choice piece you know what i mean where it was like you know what do you think <laughs> my nickname you know it was a nickname but one guy that my mike uh would always say he'd be like stevie like what are you what are you doing like just reel me in a little bit you know after like my sixth night of drinking and still you know being fit enough to pt really well and run really fast you know he'd be like but you can do it but why mm -hmm. and it was that constant sort of shaping of me as an individual where it gave me that pause the next night where it's like all right i don't want to hear it and then it would turn into i don't want to let him down and then it would turn later into i want to impress him mm -hmm. and the difference others, between like, success and failure for so many people isn't it just having a the mental a voice yeah mm -hmm. and, and 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 yet I, I mean, that, that is hugely valuable. I would argue, Steve, your experience was probably an anomaly it was. In, in the 80s. Because even when you talk to, I mean, sorry, well, 90s, 90s, yeah. 90s uh, even when you talk to SF guys, uh, certainly in the Marines, there was a lot of, you know, hey, I went through this shit. Now you're going to go through shit, too. Sure. You know? Yeah. And there was plenty of the uphill both ways. Like mm -hmm. when I went, you know, selection. Yeah. Right. When I went through selection, and this is after I've been around for a bit now in retrospect. I'm like, what in the hell? Like, we had a very limited number of slots. There was a reduction in force, mm -hmm. right? People's injury rates seemed to be higher than they ever should have been. 
um, I saw a lot of really talented, great guys get cut inexplicably, right. you know, and it was sort of like this, what the hell's going on here? Where yeah. it was like this, we call it a protector of the tab. Yeah. You know, um, so my experience was a bit, um, there's a bit of grace. There was, yeah. a, there was something, you know, maybe it was my old man over my shoulder, whatever it was. It worked out for me because mm. of the people, and it was not my talent. Like what I'd brought to the table is I was very strong and very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, I don't know what they saw in me at that well, point. Well, you, you obviously brought to the table a willingness to listen and learn. Eventually, which is yeah. Not, eventually. Which yeah. is not universal among young men, and, you know, so your mentor sensed that, I, I would guess. I hope so. I hope that was yeah. part of the equation, you know, and then I think if they see you start moving in the right direction, then they'll invest the time in you. But that's really what it was, you know. And then I had some early successes. Very few National Guard guys were getting to go to SOTEC, uh, the sniper school. Mm -hmm. And um, I did very well there. I got sent, and I was a first-time go, which which gave me a little bit of street cred. We couldn't get Ranger slots. We couldn't get Seattle. There was so much we couldn't get. Uh -huh. mm. And that slot came down the pipe, and I was able to get that and perform well. And that gave me something that, at the time, very few in the Guard had. You're talking like 1994. Right. Just not... You know, it was sort of a, um, and then to um, continue to perform in some physical capacities and some competitions and things like that. So, and I think that was sort of what it was like. So it was a bit charmed, my experience, because of the people that I happened to fall under the command of. So what were you doing in the civilian world while you were in the guard? So I was a guard, what they called a guard bomb okay. at the time. Like I was on active duty constantly. I deployed with fifth group multiple times. Um, as uh, we were a, uh, uh, I forget what it's called, designated uh, DTA, designated training affiliate with fifth group. Um, so, you know, uh, two trips to Egypt, uh, uh, 95 and 97, SEAL Team 3. Um, we started, uh, you know, hitting some of the other additional inter-service courses that we were picking up. Um, there was just a bunch of different shorter J sets or, you know, foreign internal defense missions that we would go on. So you were able to keep yourself in a fairly Working. decent cadence as I was knocking out a bachelor's degree in political science and history. So real quick, for anybody out there who's young and considering the military, being a guard bum when you're young, no bills and stuff like that, is probably the best, it's the best lifestyle you can have. Yeah. Um, you know, for yeah. SF, if you have SF intelligence, stuff like that, because anytime these teams are deploying and they need somebody, you can like Roger up, yeah. Go do your time, save your money, come back, sleep in the armory till you know you're ready to do it again. You know the life, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and um, that's really funny you said that about sleeping in the army. But there's a there's a whole cadre of individuals, a whole group of people that do that, and you get to network and know people in different locations, and then you develop a certain skill set where now you begin in, entering into this training space, and you start becoming part of this pre-deployment process where you're not deploying with that group, but you're helping get them ready, mm -hmm. you know, and then other schools become available to you, and you can make a good run at it. In particular, like you said, if you're knocking out college and doing something like that mm -hmm. at the time, or you're not quite ready to move in a direction in your life, and um, that's something we need to get over as a society. Like, there's no, you don't have to template. Uh, you know the the trajectory of your life can be can be different and challenging and unorthodox and still be rewarding and meaningful you know and and i was the i i i got there i don't know how but it worked out for me yeah you know and this this all pre 911 so what did special forces look especially you know from the guard side you were doing these you know these deployments with these active duty teams what did special forces look like at that point in time yeah so um Re complete renaissance right like so it was almost all foreign internal defense there was really little emphasis um on any type of kinetic activity mm -hmm. you know um and you know there were always fid missions to strap hang on whether it was eritrea or whether it was done in latin america or um there was a lot of um uh, drug interdiction work in mm -hmm. the United States and overseas. Mm -hmm. So if you were a commo guy in particular, or even if you weren't, but could talk to a bird, mm -hmm. you were a valuable skill set where you could strap hang with the DEA. Uh, so there was a lot of stuff like that that was going on. But it was this post-Cold War reduction in force, 
there was no enemy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Like, there really wasn't, like, an on the horizon. There was some talk about North Korea in the late 90s, and they're growing in mm-hmm. this direction, and they're becoming this and that. But nobody really took it seriously enough, maybe as they should, or I, I don't know the answer to that. Even I, I certainly didn't. Huge expending cuts. which Huge. I'm, I, I bet you even Army SF witnessed. I know the Marine Corps... We joke about it, but it's true. You know, toilet toilet paper was chained to the wall by the yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, <laughs> you know, it was like it was every fly. Yeah. <laughs> but the benefit of SF Guard is they got in on some of that war on yeah. drug money. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, JTS, like you said, like JTS, going yes. yeah, going with yep. DEA. Mm-hmm. So there there were those opportunities, and they also standardized universally the training between the active duty and the National Guard. So there used to be certain opportunities to shortcut different things. Like if you came in from the Air Force and you went through pre-selection, you didn't go through Army basic training. There was a bunch of little sort of things that I think diluted the quality of the soldier that was being produced. Mm -hmm. And then that all got aligned. And then 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And the relationship between the National Guard special operators and the active duty special operators was no longer this active duty nasty guard person it was like huh he's not in national guard combat he's right here with me right right Mm -hmm. like national guard is losing bodies as well losing souls as well and they're hurting right and i've seen this guy on his second and third and fourth deployment now so i think there was a street credibility a recognition Mm -hmm. of the need and what once was like sort of a you know like probably the active duty holding their nose at going on an active duty deployment pre 9-11 as the force began to fatigue i would suggest that it became a bit of an acknowledgement maybe not vocal of the necessity right and maybe even a bit of gratitude because i will say aside from the occasional comment here and there in the 90s i have always been treated with decency and respect and camaraderie um by the active duty counterpart Truly. Yeah. There's been some moments where you meet an occasional, you know. Right. You meet that guy. Right. But, other but that guy's that, everywhere. That's more of a statement that, about that, him. That guy's and, everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. And it's no matter what. Yeah. You know, whether it's your National Guard. And or, we got him to in a support, different way. Or your yeah. support. Yeah. Or you're on, you know, you're not on the dive team. You're on a <laughs> not right. warfare team. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's very true. The only, yeah. the only person who's really interested in the hierarchical view so you know, as as you described, as someone who's incredibly insecure, isn't it? And they, <laughs> yeah, but they I mean, have to. Yeah. They have to define clearly what they think right, is right. You know, they, the the cutoff point's right here, just just behind <laughs> I'm in, me. I'm in the yeah. chess club, and you're I'm, in the checker I'm club. The standard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so you had you had been in this guard unit then from. Like what? 95? Ninety five. Ninety two. Ninety oh ninety two. I'm sorry. Ninety two. Yeah. 92, so from ninety two. Yep. And then you were there. Qualified in 93. And then what happened for you guys on 9-11? So 9-11 was interesting. Um, now to set the backdrop, right? So Rhode Island, we have guys traveling from all over New England to go there. And some of the guys that were in our unit at the time were active duty members of the, or active members of FDNY, NYPD. Right. So that's, right. Um, and... You had this, um, when 9-11 happened, for a company, 219 in Rhode Island, I'm not saying this is accurate or fair, but from our perspective, it seemed to land a little bit differently for us. Okay. Okay. Um, I had a home in Milford, Connecticut at the time, and I could see the smoke plume. I was in the air traveling when 9-11 happened and got grounded at Midway and drove back. And as I drove back through whatever the... You know, that we've all driven them. If you're in the military, the mountains in West Virginia, that whole triangle, and yeah. you're driving through. And as we were driving through there, I remember, like, that was where I hit the first flashing lights of a convoy with heavy equipment on it, like excavators, cranes, that kind of thing. Mm. And that must have gone on for 45 minutes. So. It was an incredible moment to see the nation unified. Mm. That's the tears, right? To see the nation mm. coalesce in that way of like, we don't even know what we're doing, but we're going to try to do something. Nobody was asking for anybody to go yet. They didn't even right. know what they were dealing with. The ground was still too hot to be there. Like, But people were mobilizing to do something. And I think for me and many of the people that I now call friend in the space um, and brothers, it was a gift 
to be in proximity to do something about it. Now that actual do something about it wouldn't happen for our unit for a number of years. Wouldn't happen until Iraq in 2005, 2006, then in Afghanistan in 2008, 2009, and then 2011 and 2013. But generally speaking, there was this huge lull. So right after 9-11, we all got activated. We ended up in Kuwait. I don't remember for how long. Truly, like I think it was, uh, could be six months, could have been ten. I have no idea. It seemed like a long one because we weren't in Afghanistan. And the idea was we were going to Kuwait and we were training up and we were aligning our battalions and then we were going to go back to Bragg to refit and then go back over into the box. And that's what we wanted. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all wanted that so desperately. I think a lot of people did, but we were really like the, we had, like I said, we had a member with us that was literally on his second or third day with FDNY when his firefighting company was decimated by the, yeah. the, the casualties, you know? So we felt it very personal. And when we didn't get to go, it was incredibly frustrating. And that that went into the mix of events that happened where it was like, okay, I deployed in 95 and 97 and 98 to some degree, and then in 2002, and now we've hit this pot spot where it doesn't look like we're going anywhere as a battalion. So you know what, I'm not gonna keep watching people go off to war. And that was when I got off and went to uh, nursing school. Yeah. And I got off and I just now, stopped. What, what took so long because there were uh, SF units yeah. that got, like, I know 5th and 19th out of West Virginia got uh, deployed pretty quickly. Like, what took yeah. so long to get you got to get your unit there? Yeah. So I can't actually, so I can't or second accurately. Or 19th. Sorry. Yeah. Second and 19th. Yeah. I can't accurately speak to it just because I wasn't at that yeah. level. So, and uh, if I would be speaking, it would be very speculative, right? But what had happened to some degree was they had taken different companies from different battalions and i'm not saying it was political that was the rumor at the time and i'll say that that it, there was sort of like you know certain people from different units and it was i think it was an idea of spreading it around a bit and that everybody's going to get their chance anyway so stop your complaining these are the guys and that are going now and for the listeners i say guys because it's all male units um, and these are these are the guys that are going and then they're going to get their time and you'll probably be following. You'll probably be ripping them out in six months or nine months. And that's uh -huh. how it's going to go. And then that went down and it was proving to be administratively catastrophic is my understanding. So then they were like, all right, you know what? This isn't going to work. We're going to consolidate the battalions and no one's going anywhere until the battalions are consolidated and we will deploy them as battalions. Uh -huh. Well, now we've had two thirds of our battalion deployed. And now we get reconsolidated and they're like, well, they just went and they just went. So a company got put in this predicament where we weren't going to be going into war until the battalion spun up. So a lot of people started to jump out and strap hang on other units. I attempted to do that. And I think all of us did. And then it got to the point where there was such an exodus or a potential for such an exodus. They put the brakes on it and they were like, no more interstate transfers. No more this, no more that. And then. I would say somewhere around 2006, 2007, the battalions became realigned and they started deploying as Cycle. battalion elements yeah. in a normal cadence. Yeah, that that's tough because in that time, I'm sure that there were SF units that were deploying a lot and needed a little bit of a reprieve. Um, not a lot, okay. truly. So there was a, a, a natural cadence that was happening. What the bigger piece of it was is we were a story, but there was a group in Ohio that had the same issue happen, a group in Texas, a group in mm -hmm. California. So the disenfranchisement of it wasn't shared just by a company alone. It was companies dispersed. I see. Everywhere, though, not in proximity to the battalion headquarters. Right. Right. No. Um, right. And again, not commenting, but the, the battalion and the headquarters and it just they got in the box first. Yeah. That happened. Right. I see. Yeah. Um, where where was where was your headquarters at? Uh, so West Virginia and Utah. Oh, it was West Virginia. Yeah, Utah. yeah. Okay. So West Virginia and Utah. So that was fifth and second, right? Or so it was. Um, so it was. Or nineteenth. Yeah, yeah. you're taxing. So it was nineteenth. So our group headquarters was Utah, uh -huh. and then our battalion headquarters was West Virginia. Okay. So West Virginia had two companies. Might have been a. Might have been a company and a support element, and you know, and then it might as was another one not co-located. 
and then there was Rhode Island. And and at the time, because they wanted like to do this, they wanted you guys to deploy as a unit. They they weren't letting you do the interstate transfers. They were like slowing down the strap hanging where you could just fill the billets. Yeah. Even if you were willing to, you that know? must have been in, incredibly frustrating. Yeah, I mean, it drove a lot of us to be like, "Yeah, done. Yeah, gonna go figure something else out." Yeah, um, and especially those of us that like, I I didn't have a skill set on the military side, and I had made a commitment. Um, there was a, a guy that was in our unit who was pursuing medical school named uh, Jason Smith, who actually would um, complete medical school. He, and it's a sad story. He's one of the casual, I don't know if he's casualty of war or casualty something, but he took his own life a few years ago, but he became a physician, but he and I had a conversation and my mother had passed. And I saw this team of individuals working on her to try to save her life. This was in 2001, right before 9-11. And it sparked something in me where I knew I wanted to um, be in proximity again. I wanted to be able to do something in those moments. So that was when I was like, I'm done. And that was when I... Um, filled out my nursing school application. I got my pre my prereqs done for medical school with the intention of nursing and then uh, hopefully uh, uh, an acceptance into medical school and then becoming a physician. Was electronic funds transfer one of the prerequisites? On that? <laughs> Probably, yeah. as I'm thinking about yeah. it, certainly for the GI uh, Bill. Yeah, so uh, so you, you went to school then f to be a, a RN, an ICU RN. Now, when you're going to nursing school, do you pick what field you want to be in, or is it no? Kind you of just a... get your registered nurse, and then depending on how your interview and depending on what you want to pursue, um, you might end up in like an ICU or you might end up in an ED. It was actually pretty rare. Normally, you have to go to the floor for a couple of years to just do what they would call regular nursing or bedside nursing, and then um, I um, seemed to get lucky again and uh, got picked up for a critical care uh, internship at Yale, and it was like. Four months of ICU, four months of SICU, four months of cardiothoracic ICU, four months of emergency med. So you didn't have any real patient responsibility per se, but you had, again, that mentorship piece, and you got to see critical care performed. You got to learn how to operate vents and get great IV access and port cath access and those important skill sets. So when did you graduate nursing school and then the uh, ICU or the critical care piece of that? 2004. 2004. When you... Like when you were in school or when you were working in the hospital, because you spent a number of years in the military, 11, 12, 12 years in the military. Off and on, yeah. yeah. And you were a special operator. And it feels like a long time when there's this war going on to, like a lot of people get out in a peacetime military and they're frustrated that they never went to war. Mm -hmm. But you were actually there, you know, during a war and you never got to go after spending all your time Prep. training for that. Yeah. Did you have any particular feelings about I that? I was devastated and you felt, so there was the part of it where you were angry at a system, right? And again, I'm not even claiming to understand what really went into it, right? I think sometimes we take these things like Steve Forty is actually not that yeah. important. Yeah. Like this had nothing to do with me. Right. And it's even very if those, easily to take it. Right. Yeah, yeah. And even if those rumors are true, there's right. usually generally speaking, when you peel back the onion on all these things, people generally act with good intention. Yeah. I, I really I think that proves out over time. Yeah. You know, so, sometimes um, it's organizational incompetence. Yeah. Not not necessarily mal not not with malintent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and sometimes it is politics and favoritism, and people are acting. Yeah. Like, oh, sometimes, but if I'm yeah. going to make that claim, I yeah. need, but, I need to know it. But yeah. that's the definition of a political decision in the military: <laughs> one that does not favor you, or one that results oh, in, sure. in your punishment. Oh, sure. Right. <laughs> I I know that there were always general officers who had it out for me personally. <laughs> but yeah, but I was heartbroken, you yeah. know. And and then the worst thing was. You know, like you walk through the community yeah. with a full willingness to serve and you start hearing that, you know who you should meet, you know, so-and-so had two tours and, and you're like, please make it stop. Yeah, so you get yeah. to the point where you're not even telling yeah. people you ever served at all. Right. Um, which is why a lot of us, after some time and some settling, ended up reenlisting and going back in and then ultimately doing what we had wanted but, or allegedly. Wanted. I'm avoiding using the term transition. 
It's okay. But talk to me about nursing school. That must have been a period of huge growth. <laughs> it was <laughs> <really> like, <laughs> like, yeah, we'll get the dates over, but I, I just want to hear about it. Yeah. Um, so nursing school is interesting. So I'm in this, you know, group. I'm 30 plus years old. I'm one of three men in, in the class. And um, how, every, how big is the class? Uh, probably 50 or 60, I guess. And was like sort of two split, but probably 50 or 60. Um, really good test takers, really good, uh, smart women mm -hmm. that not only understand nursing, but also understand the test taking procedures and the prep and how to prep and all that. And I'm yeah. a, I never really went to college. Well, were you treated any differently as a male, do you think? A hundred percent. And and it's funny because, you know, you had these moments right now that wouldn't fly today yeah. um, where we weren't, um, you know, we'd be asked to leave during like OBGYN rotations where like, you know, part of the curriculum was that you were supposed to you know participate oh, in yeah, like the yeah. OR for C-section, stuff yeah. like that. And even back then, some women are like, no, it's not happening. Yeah. So you'd miss out on an educational opportunity or things like that. Not yeah. overwhelmingly like it was. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, and of course you hear the comments and some of them are earned, you know, like the way you fold your scrubs. Right. And, you know, typical man and that kind of thing. You would yeah. hear those comments, but it never bothered. It was part of the joke and the shuck and jive. Yeah. But you were sent out. Because you were a man, and what you were seeing was very private yeah, to a yeah, female. Yep. You know? And um, and, that and you would, couldn't just say, I, "Actually, I've seen this before." And it's uh, right. I uh, need. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. not a big deal. Yep. And then you get to a point where you you know spend a couple of years nursing, and you you know catch a few babies in a parking lot, and you know all of that piece of it goes away. Yeah. Like you would be thrown out for yeah, the routine. Gonna, did that happen? Oh yeah. Yeah, really? that, yeah. Any ED nurse will deal with that. If you okay, spend a few we years. got it. Got a double tap on that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I always thought that would be the coolest coolest yeah. thing to do, actually. Yeah. And, and, it, it, and it's, it's one of those life goals that I'll never achieve. <laughs> right. Deliver a baby. And, well, you never know, right? Oh, yeah. That's, but that's it's true, one of yeah. those things where it's like, so when you look at the criticality of a patient, their tolerance for the little stuff, right. like you sort of yeah. directly. So when someone's bleeding out, it doesn't matter. Right. Like whoever you are, be the most competent person to fix this problem. Apply yeah. this tourniquet. Yeah. Manage my airway. You don't care. But when it's like in a clinical setting. Right. Right. Sure. Like when you're working in less of a, an acute environment, that's when the personality mm. piece comes out where it's like, I don't want him in here, you know, get him out of here. And, and I think that I'm sure that swings both ways, even when it comes to oh, how they oh, treat I get the it. Staff. I get it. It's from right. the patients. Yeah. Okay. Like, right. or right. even yeah. how they treat the staff. Like if you're bleeding out, it's like, who is the most competent person? Yeah. Right. Like just get that most. And then if you're there for something more routine, I think that's when the personality. Per yeah. That makes perfect sense. Meanwhile, like, if you're doing like male urinary stuff, like they're not like, hey, nurses, leave like hey nurses check me out probably yeah right? guys are yeah. like yeah okay. guys are shameless right, right? <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but then again i've never right. been in that position but then you have somebody that's critically ill right yeah. just serious and, 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 urinary right. involvement yeah. and then all of a sudden it's like who is the skilled person that's right. going to make me comfortable you right know? Well, what what was what did you find was the most difficult thing i mean it you know, obviously, I'm not among you, in nursing you, i mean you were you were drawn to this you, you had a passion for it pediatric abuse Pediatric abuse. Oh God! And if I think about it, I get emotional. Yeah. Like to have yeah. like a, a kid come in that was intentionally abused or burned. Yeah. Um, molested. Mm. These things that you see, um, in particular, in a, a level one type trauma center, and um, a, a level one trauma center that's also a burn unit, and you see like an immersion injury or somebody took an iron to a kid, just like that kind of thing, and you go through, and maybe it's just because of who we are, right? But here's the reality. When you talk at, and I don't drink anymore as I mentioned, but when you talk at a bar, what would you say? Oh, I'd effing kill that guy or kill that, whatever, right? But the reality is you feel the crippled nature of that moment yeah. and the absolute inability to do anything else yeah. than to bring that kid some comfort. Yeah. And you got to eat the frustration. Yeah. And that's why you go cry in the parking lot in the parking garage and you drive home frustrated or many of us would go. And that was sort of where the mentorship became a beautiful thing because the more senior people would identify that in you. And sometimes they'd be there like, you good? You need a minute? You know, that little bit of like, I see you. Yeah. It's going to be all right. You know, um, anything with kids involved. I, How do you I, keep your marbles? I well, mean, you've, you've got habits. You've developed habits. I don't, I haven't met you long but i can tell you've developed habits that that allow you to 
to to continue I, keeping I your marbles that, yeah. is the one is the best expression that I can I can yeah. use all in one pile. So. so I think I used to white knuckle it, right? Mm. There was a quote that I had written in a journal a long time ago. It was uh, you know Andrew Jackson, and when I start saying it, you all say I'm finishing for him, but it's you know I, I was born for a storm, and a calm doesn't suit me. And I think I spent a lot of time like locking up. Look how look how calm I am. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah. but yeah. inside you're just white knuckling it. And then as I began to get older, you start putting these things in place. For me, one of those things was sobriety, you know, like as a, as a gesture. One of those things was sobriety where... <laughs> no, was but what led you to that? I, I mean, they, all, all of the habits. I mean, to, but it, yeah. it's interesting. I, I, yeah. So, well, this and, need... and doubtless what you were about to say will help people, whether they're... Oh, I mean, they what a great outcome that would be. <laughs> well... Um, you know, where I am right now is because of vigorous study and a curious nature in the topic, right? But I would say the um, thing of not drinking became just a byproduct of like, all right, uh, being a parent is hard. Being successful is hard. Yeah. I got enough emotional baggage yeah. with the alcoholic history of my family. Like all of this is hard. And I, you know, what set out to be a journey to to prove to somebody how wrong they were about my drinking <laughs> led into like 30 days to 90 days. <laughs> and then all of a sudden people are like, what are you doing different? You look great, you know? And then a year later, I got some guys I really respect that I used to sort of, you know, Viking out with, with the booze and the physical fitness and that kind of thing. And they're coming in and like, talk to me about sobriety. And before you know it, you know, the August 1st will be eight, will be, will be eight years. Wow. Um, and That's I awesome. never ever envisioned that I'd be somebody that wouldn't have a drink for eight years. Right. You know? And I don't judge anybody for whatever choices Thank they you. have. <laughs> but I also don't pull back on understanding that for myself and for others, yeah. there's a consequence to all our choices. Right. And right now, I love not being hungover. Yeah. And I love having the mindfulness to take care of my body and my mind. I love focusing how do you, on... How do you maintain that? I mean, you've got a schedule that's right now that's schedule. insane so how, how do you how do you maintain being in the moment for any any part of the day yeah so you tie it to uh activities right so you take the things that you don't love to do or even things you might be skeptical skeptical about or things you think can wait and you pair them with the essentials right so i'll just give an example and and this is a there's a guy named seth hickerson who um, has a, he's a veteran himself, actually, and uh, he's done a lot of great work in the space. He was an earlier adopter and teacher of this, but it would be called like an emotional control routine. So you develop these habits, and like my habit in this space, so every day I get six minutes of breath work, mm -hmm. first click of the seatbelt in the morning, first time I log on to a computer, right? You and do, you start your breath work. Yeah, two minutes. And, you, and that's all oh, you need. So you six, six minutes. Just like six minutes mindful day. breathing. And, and any one of them, hold, resident breath, breathing, breath box holds. breathing. Yeah, uh, there's a series of different yeah. ones like resonant breathing, box breathing, and all of these different things that are part of a fundamental basis. It's it's one of the levers we can pull, right? The overarching topic that I speak about and is my job right now is something called autonomic downregulation. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. the idea or autonomic self-regulation, mm -hmm. right? So before we thought about what being a warrior was what? Never stopping, rail against the machine, like nay, just yeah. do what's required, yeah. right? But when you look at the craft, okay, LeBron James is not getting ready to go out onto the court listening to We Will Rock You. Right. You'll find him on the bench right now doing breath work and mindfulness because we know that's the key to performance. Autonomic self-regulation is the mastery of the modern-day warrior. And whether or not you're in a war or not, it's what it is. So the levers that you can pull are things like, and they're so unsexy, <laughs> right? Like sleep hygiene. Do you, do you mind pausing for a moment to explain what what you mean by autonomic yeah. self regulation? I'm so glad you just asked that because I was just going off on my normal tangent. They've they've prompted me. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> um, so what it is is um, we are all we all have this fight or flight response, and it's effective. And in guys with the lives that we've led, it's actually a little bit more vigilant and it's a little bit more effective. And there's these biochemical reactions that take place. 
and with those reactions have outcomes and some of those outcomes are negative consequence no, mm -hmm. bear with me i know i'm no 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 but this, this, I, so this let's is say we're in, yep, fascinating let's say we're in fight or flight you and i we don't know each other mm -hmm. right and we walk into a room and we're not on the same team and we look at each other and something's sort of peaking up right so i see the way you look you see the way you look it's exactly what right. you're talking about the other day dave right you know easier to do with a stranger sorry we yeah no. we, we were talking about this the other day about how a lot of us are very uh, are very um what's the word um we we live within certain rules but we keep our circle tight right and people outside that circle are subject to uh, we tend different to, rules yeah. yeah very different rules. yeah and that's part of the village we yeah. can actually go back yeah. to that yeah. because that's actually a evolutionary trait yeah okay well we'll go back to that because there's a social media tie-in as well yeah. so but you and i don't know each other we size each other up maybe you think hey look like somebody that you don't want to deal with maybe i don't want to deal with you and there's a dance that takes place but either way hypervigilance begins to creep in yeah. you feel the heartbeat and the heart rate and as you live that more you get there quicker but you manage it better yeah right you feel the ears everything gets a little bit louder but you can't tell the nuance you detect movement really well, but you don't see the details. And I'll just stop there. There's about seven other of yeah. them, right? So that's the space. Now, that's a state of hyperarousal or hypervigilance or autonomic upregulation. That which, is fight or flight. Which gets out of whack very quickly. I think that, again, mm -hmm. for me, yep. that was out of whack totally. Totally. So that that right. would be activated so when it didn't need right to Right now, be. I'm going to call you out on something. Show me with your hands how you clear a malfunction and a weapon pistol. <laughs> Okay. Right. You didn't do the sexy. Right. Right. You didn't do the yeah. sexy James Bond, right? Because no. at that moment of stress, you lose the manual dexterity. Yeah. You slap it and rack it. Right. Yeah. That is because that's what you can do in a state of autonomic upregulation. Mm. Right. So ask yourself: If you're swinging a baseball bat, where do you want to be on that fight or flight? If you have to shoot a puck, what if you have to make an incision as a surgeon or write code? But yet we live in small, this small muscle skills. Yeah. But we live in this state of hypervigilance. Now let's get away from the skills. What about parenting? Yeah. How well are you as a dad going to detect the nuance, the face, the grimace of your child if there's an anxious moment or a scare moment where you hit that on the head, you nail it as a dad, and you're like, I see you right now. This is what's happening, right? So we oh, live I'm, in I'm a... still learning. And we uh, all are. We all are. I... I, I I mess that up all the time. And we, first of all, everyone does, right? We do it more mm -hmm. because of the lives we led, right? And with all of that upregulation comes a problem, and that problem is inhibition, okay? It's the idea that you can't recognize the consequence of your action. So blowing up and screaming to get the desired end state gets the end state, but you don't recognize the consequence. Right. And you're thinking of a very specific moment right now as I'm saying this, right? Like, and that happens to all of us. Now, we've led lives, some more than others, that get us to a state of hypervigilance more quickly. Mm -hmm. We have an obligation, a moral obligation as a parent, as a team leader, as an employer, right? To pull the levers so we operate within those confines of what we can control. Mm -hmm. So instead of actually saying, like, I'm calm in a storm, actually not feeling the storm. And how do you do that? You do it with sobriety for some people. And everybody's levers are different. Mm -hmm. Sleep hygiene, mm -hmm. gratitude, forgiveness, right? Intimacy, right? Physical fitness. All of these different breath work, meditation, self-hypnosis, all of these things, they're none of these are speculative now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have been proven, and proven like on MRI, and proven on uh, EEG, mm -hmm. where they measure the amygdala response, the fight or flight control center. So these aren't up for discussion. When people are like, oh, that doesn't work. It works if yeah. you apply it. So what do we do, like I said before? It, we tie them to our daily lives. Steve, I, I would argue, no one's gonna argue with you on that. Most veterans I know have, you know, I believe in it. What I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I've started doing for what it's worth meditation, everything, and it has awesome. changed my life. A hundred percent has changed my life. Um, but a lot of guys find it really difficult to yeah. start, really difficult because what pulled us into the military, our ADHD. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And and it's really, really hard. So I'm going to push back, okay? As leaders whether you're a leader as a parent or whether you're a leader in the military or whether you're a leader in, at HSS, which I happen to be around amazing leaders, okay? 
the extent at which a person like you mentors, we go back to the mentorship piece, a person coming up and saying, before you get there, yeah. where you're out of control and we have to regain control, these are the levers that you need to push and you need to automate the pulling and pushing of these buttons and levers to keep you where you need to be, to be LeBron or to be you know, whoever it is you need to be at that moment, and whether it's as a parent and whether it as is as a warrior, you know, you have to autonomically self-regulate. It's yeah. not an option anymore. So you said it changed your life. There's a skepticism and that same thing with like, and, and I'll give you a, where I'm totally full of shit here in a moment about it. <laughs> But there's a moment where we know, like, we know sobriety is a bad idea for, or not lack of sobriety is a bad idea for most veterans. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We got 22 per day yeah, or there's, whatever, there's, 17. To there's no case where someone said, hey, you know, man, I, I just went on a bender and it really, <laughs> it really never, yeah. it fixed yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. forgot everything. Yeah. My, my yeah. wife thinks I'm hot again. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting yeah. along with my children. I'm yeah. back to church on Sundays. <laughs> and none of it would have happened without the drug addiction. <laughs> right. A hundred percent. Right. <laughs> But we don't make room for the idea of sobriety. We actually yeah. go the other way with it. And even when you talk about my early days in a team, it was like, oh, it would. Be I don't back want then. the guy yeah. that can't do this hungover. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Like, and and it was and even like, a, can you do it while you're hungover? The whole right. bonding thing, uh, bon team bonding. Uh, uh, you know, whether you're in the Marine Corps, I'm sure the conventional army, SF. A sure, lot of it was wrapped around alcohol. Absolutely, eighties, nineties. I yeah. mean, there's there's yeah, no escaping it. 100%. You were a weirdo if you didn't drink, and it didn't right. matter if you were the most competent, capable guy in the world. Yeah, right. And how do we flip that to where it's like this idea? And now you're a weirdo if you drink. Yeah, right. Like how do we change? Like, it? Well, listen, I, I don't. I want to be invited back to the team house. So I'm yeah. not. But look <laughs> what happened. With, look what happened with drinking and driving. Yeah. Like right. drinking and yeah. driving was accepted practice in the 80s, 80s. and early 90s. Right. Yeah. And if you got caught, it was like, oh, you're an idiot. And yeah. I have to say, I honestly, I was never that person. Yeah. Truly. Um, I was awful in a number of different ways, you know. But I'll give you that. And I just want to be fair to myself and to you all about like how full of shit I can be. Like, it's a problem in our lives. Yeah. 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 And this should be thrown in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. But I literally would get on a plane and go to war probably before I would yeah. Yeah. I've used that I used that line before when I was on the, the vet. Like I and I just it sort of struck me. I was like, what's it gonna take for us to recognize the damage this thing is causing? Well, and so when are gonna, I, I want to get back to yeah, what please. you were talking about when I interrupted you and we, we asked you to but you were talking about your routine yeah. every day, which I think like and and yes, of course you you're a slave to your phone that's that's partly, uh, largely beyond your control. Yeah. But you anchor yourself, right, with things that you do every day. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of people are missing, just making it a habit, right? Yep. You're talking about breath work, two minutes a day. <laughs> two minutes, it, three it, times it, a day? How, ha easy, how right? many guys yeah. get up and just automatically will do CrossFit or, uh, right. you know. And CrossFit is great to an extent. Okay, but if not properly supported, yeah. vigorous exercise By is it going to create a state of hypervigilance. Right. Yeah. And in the presence of alcohol and poor nutrition and poor rest and sleep hygiene, like the pillars begin. There's a hierarchy and it starts with sleep. You're not going to be sane or decent or good at anything without sleeping right. yeah. unless you're trying to be a good insomniac. Like otherwise, yeah. otherwise you're going to fail. Okay, yeah. so that's one. And then what else we do? Well, everything else is a supportive effort for sleep. So moderate, sometimes vigorous exercise. Nutrition is something that supports sleep. Alcohol abstinence supports sleep or mm. alcohol moderation. It doesn't have to be moderate. You know what I mean? But yeah. like intimacy supports sleep. Gratitude supports sleep. So when we get down to it, how do we create a culture where we recognize yeah. the importance of sleep? Of the pillars. They, yeah. yeah. Right. It's like how wrong the food pyramid has been. Yeah. We're also wrong with the if there was a lifestyle choice pyramid. Actually, flag that moment. We should do a lifestyle choice pyramid. But if there was a lifestyle choice pyramid, we would have it all wrong right now. Yeah. 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 So and I remember it, my senior drill instructor saying, "You only need like three or four hours sleep. The rest is just for dreaming." Yeah. <laughs> it's well, like, and, and you were like, "Brilliant." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, and that's stuck in my mind. <laughs> that's the only thing I learned from him. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, sort of rolling this, and this is great information for anybody, but rolling this back to veterans. And, you know, it, it, I don't say in particular <clears throat> soft veterans because I think a lot of, a lot of like regular infantry veterans, you know, went through this when they were out in fire bases. But, you know, you talk about sleep, 
the hypervigilance and things like that. And I think it, it's what happens to a lot of people in those circumstances, especially if it's for a prolonged period of time or when it's repeated over and over and over again through multiple deployments is not only are you going a lot of times with very little sleep because you're running nighttime ops and then up during the day training and doing that stuff, but the hypervigilance also, it gets stuck in, it's not, it's not like, it's not uh, like I'm in a room and there's a target in front of me or it's, you know, one second before the shot clock goes off, it's, it's always one second yeah. before the shot clock, that yeah. there's always a target in front of me, even if I'm in a room sitting by myself. Yeah. And there was a psychologist or psychiatrist, I, I can't recall right now, by uh, name of Claude Bernard in the 1800s. And he was the one that first sort of started working into this and leaning into the space of the fight or flight response. And the, the initial hypothesis, which they couldn't prove then, but can now because of functional MRIs and different technology, is that in the absence of a threat, we will redefine and reassess what a threat is. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what was once like saber tooth tiger, sea croc, primate going to kill us and rip yeah. our limbs off now becomes cell phone at 3% and I might get a call from my boss. Right. Right. We've redefined what a threat is. Right now, they've actually begun doing work in this space when we talk about like Instagram and this connectivity and the impact that that has and relative to being thrown out of the village. If you're not getting enough attention, likes and dislikes, or you're fearing this, and well, why is that relevant? What do you think your shelf life was, even 400 years ago, without a community to sure. support right. you? Yeah. Right, death, days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like unless yeah. you were a different kind of a badass that right. had yeah. a different support structure. Right. You know, but you throw a kid mm -hmm. in the mix, and you can't leave the kid to go hunt, and you know, so yeah. being a part of the village, and that's why this social mm -hmm. media piece, I think, and this is speculative. Most of what I say is not anecdotal, but this is somewhat anecdotal is like the social media piece yeah. and that power is that it, it becomes a real that. fear or a, a, i mean genuine fear a we triggering may, event we may look at it yeah. from outside and say that's ridiculous but it is you know and especially for to the these kids, kids. Yeah. yeah you know and for some and adults too i mean right. it's yeah yeah why else would it have the power to get children to take their own life right yeah. Right. Right. It's because in a state of hypervigilance, as I said, one of the things that goes is inhibition. You're not recognizing consequence. Because mm. how bad would it be if you had this really healthy pause as you were fleeing certain death? Right. Where you're like, I need to jump from building top to building top, but this doesn't seem like a great idea. Let me contemplate. Yeah. yeah. So evolutionarily, it sort of reinforced this action without consequence mentality. Mm. It is a neural patterning. It's a networking that's ingrained in us. Yeah. And we will upregulate and we in particular have this capacity because of the lives that we led to get ourselves the rest we need and then to flip a switch and be in fight or flight right and then eventually we lose sight of what down regulated is right and yeah. that's where many of us are living and there's physiologic consequences to that and those things you're talking about the pillars the the habits other things that bring you back into connection with yourself and stop you getting out of reg yeah so everything it doesn't you know the everything it, it, here's again i think one of the problems i had before and now it's slowly becoming clearer i was thinking well i can't be in the moment because all this shit's happening mm -hmm. you know that i've got a plan for but but what you've you've just said so as you pick up what i've discovered is i've picked up these habits and i'm nowhere near where you are steve but i've discovered i'm actually much better at handling those things when they come along and what i need to do is trust myself and say, right now, you don't need to think about that shit because you'll be fine and you'll be able to handle that. But right now, you need to reconnect with yourself. And that is the, the hardest part. I'm nowhere near in the same realm as LeBron James, but I imagine, <laughs> you know, he knows he's going to hit Nor some hard challenges on the court, things he yep. can't possibly foresee. And, you know, in the yeah. time, so he just focuses on himself. And, and to be realistic, up. if he does make an error, he'll have 90 minutes in a hyperbaric chamber in his bedroom to think about it. Right. Right. Like yeah. there's resources right. that he has available yeah, to him right. that yeah. most people can only dream about. But the lowest lying fruit is accessible to just about everyone right now. Sure. So sleep, to some extent, others get a vote on your sleep. But if you take something like breath work. Right. I'll put it to you this way. When we teach this at the hospital and when we teach it in different environments, okay, 
we try to stick to the things that you could do regardless of the environment mm -hmm. that you're in. So if we take something like resonant breathing, five seconds in, five seconds out, it's already been studied, it's already proven to work better when paired with other activities, right? So the whole, like, I don't have time for two minutes of breathing, argument's yeah. gone, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You so, gotta breathe anyway. Right. You must well so breathe correctly. Breathe well. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. That's a beautifully, way, beautiful way to put it. So if we were to get that, so what would be, what do we do when we leave a range? Right? What do we do every single time? Right? Clear our weapons. Right? Yeah. Buddy checks the weapons, checks it twice. Police press. Right check it again, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Right? And then, yeah. Right? So you go through that. Well, what happens if that then becomes clear your weapons, holster your weapons, circle up? We're going to do two minutes of box breathing or two minutes of random breathing. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, if you were to try to do that, I think half the people would laugh at you and the other half would be like, I'm in. 10 years ago, everyone would actually laugh at you. Right. 15 mm -hmm. years ago, you would probably end up as a psych eval. Right. Right. So there's a shift, a positive yeah. shift that's happening across many industries, but it's not happening quick enough. Yeah. If we think about this space of like hypervigilance and you measured it and if people like, and we can measure it to some degree, not accurately enough, but if there was a ring that would tell us when somebody's in that state, what do you think the color of that ring would be when somebody was bullying someone? Right. Right. Like, do you think bullies go around in a state of normal vigilance and they're mm -hmm. very chill and they're like, this is fun. They lack the inhibition. Mm -hmm. They lack the ability to see the pain they're causing. They lack the understanding to see consequence. Well, why? Well, what's going on at home that's putting them in this state yeah. of right. vigilance? Right. Yeah. Right. They've got a, uh, a massively enlarged uh, amygdala. I'm probably I'm probably using I'm using the, the you know I would say it probably doesn't massively sensitive amygdala. Like, yeah, lit like yeah. yeah. If, you know it's the size of a walnut, but it controls a lot. Yeah, right. And it controls some incredibly powerful chemicals, one of which is adrenaline. There's no way around that fact. Mm. That, yeah, that when that gets triggered, it needs to be untriggered. And normally, you would go through this process where if there was a threat that was available, you would respond to that mm. threat. Right. And then you would recover when that threat abated and you would go on living a state of normal vigilance. Well, what is the the, the term is allostatic load. What is the load of walking on the Vegas Strip right now with the beeps, the buzzes, the teens, the lights, the, just the brightness of the visual field, possible criminal. The, you know what I mean? All yeah, these different yeah. threats. Right. Yeah. Presence of alcohol. There's so much allostatic load, even that Times Square. Yeah. And that's just one element of these things. Yeah. Very interesting. So. I don't mean to shift gears, but I, I want to talk about, you know, so you're, you get a job in nursing, yeah. right? It, you, you work in the uh, critical care mm -hmm. and how long, like, do you do that? And what's that like for you? Yeah. So from 2003 to 2008 um, was when I was a, an ED nurse. And um, highs and lows, right? Like I talked to you about, like, you know, dealing with the child abuse and things like that. Um, and not just abuse. Like, you know, we dealt with a, a young boy. It's a famous case. I, I can't say the name, but if anyone Googled it, but it was a drowning of a young boy. Um, and that, at the time, was challenging. Um, then became more challenging for me as a parent, right? These things yeah. come back in those types of cycles. Um, but I think what was good about the job for me was um, I think we all have a sense of service. We want to do some good in the world and make a buck, right? And I, I, I think yeah. we put them sort of somewhat equally. Like I, I, there's, there's probably no amount of money, maybe, but probably no amount of money that would make the value of our work completely unimportant. Mm -hmm. Right, like we, you know what I mean. Like we're, gonna, we're not going to cross a moral line, or we're not going to do something that's totally self-serving. So somewhere in there, there's a balance between fiscal responsibility and achievement, and then value in the work that mm -hmm. you create. And for me, nursing at the time was that it was a, a, a economic solution, not an amazing one, but a decent one, and it's gotten better. I worked a ton of overtime, so it was actually pretty good. Um, it didn't interfere with my National Guard life. Like I was still able to, you know, do some stuff if I wanted to, or at least that was my plan. Like so, my, so did you stay in the National Guard or did you? No, no, I okay. got out completely when I got okay. out. But my plan was when I went back and everything, I thought eventually that I might sign back up. Yeah. You know, um, but but I, I, I didn't until a few number of years later for different, different reasons. Um, but there was this 
feeling good about your work and if you had a night where you didn't and those things i mentioned like the child drowning was like a once in a career moment right or the burns and the pediatric burns and abuse and stuff like that those were few and far between relative to the amount of good you get to do mm -hmm. and even if you have somebody come in with a relatively stable anaphylactic reaction you're still saving their life and that feels good right you know or if you spot it like i when i worked in the in the ed like one of my personal pride points was how quickly you got somebody to the cath lab somebody comes in an active mi and the speed at which you get iv access get them prepped get them triaged and get them on the table to be cath time is tissue i used to love that excitement and that meaning in that and it was the idea of keeping calm keeping them calm working fast and efficiently and having a positive impact on somebody's life right another flip side of that is sometimes you come in and people with drug dependencies really try on your on your patients and your decency you know um and sometimes there's really really mean people in the world but that's part of any workplace but generally speaking i felt very good about the job i got to do and i, I it was one of the it was the difference between like having to do a job and getting to do a job and I felt like I was getting to do that job. Yeah. Do you, uh, you know, it, it's interesting because it, it's a really interesting comparison because you hadn't been to combat at this point in time, but you, now you're in this comparable environment in terms of very high stress. But one of the things that you mentioned is like when you, for somebody comes in with a myocardial infarction and, and you're, you know, cath in them and you're trying to keep them calm, does keeping was it, it does trying to keep somebody calm while you're doing something stressful does that actually help you self-regulate and keep you calm also i would i hadn't thought about it but i know that nothing gets easier and always knew that nothing got easier or better under that like <laughs> tense rigor you know i know communication calm clear communication yeah. wins every time and i knew that then and you develop those skills you know, you even develop a pitch, like when somebody comes in and you got to tell them, listen, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, you are in fact having a heart attack, but you're going to be okay because we got a cath lab and Dr. So-and-so is on. And I don't like drama, but you're going to see me move quickly. Mm -hmm. And you set the stage for like what's going to happen. And you look for the buy-in. You look for that head nod. Mm -hmm. That moment I talked about earlier where it's like, I don't care who you are. <laughs> right. Fix me. But right. you just hit on a key point, the communication up front. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 have a, I don't have any medical experience at all, but as a, as a user, uh, um, you know, I've seen where things go awry. It's often been simply that upfront explanation of what's going on to the patient. Yeah. Has not occurred. It, it's also <laughs> interesting because you reminded me of a couple of things when you talked about your tone in that one when there's, when there is, like in a firefight, if if you, you notice like really skilled JTACs or CCT mm -hmm. guys, they're so calm on the radio. And also whoever, like the team leader, squad leader, commander, whoever is the authority figure, when they're on the radio, if they're calm on the radio, then everybody else kind of settles down. If they're high pitched, then I feel like that kind of sets a tenor, right? Yeah. That that, that that, that communication style, either in an emergency situation or a high stress situation, like it makes a ton of difference, not just to you, but to the, you know, to, but to the people around you, obviously. It's interesting. I had the gift of being an AST for like the first five weeks of my deployment in 2009. Uh, AST is a, a position up at like the, you know, one of the positions up in uh, the Siege of Soda for the Soda where you're a liaison essentially. Yeah. And I, for anybody listening that would, would need to know that piece of it. And I was like, literally like they make you an AST generally speaking when you're competent, right? Because they're, you're managing multiple teams you're outside the wire and, and you're representing. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I did it, you know, kicking and screaming and everybody's selling me on it. They're like, no, yeah, you're gonna live, love it. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna yeah. live in a shipping container, yeah. you're gonna have a thing. And I'm like, no, I wanna be out with the guys. But what that does is it brings you into one, the planning process, and you get to understand what the importance of these things that everybody makes fun of, like the con ops. And I'm not saying they need to be 60 pages long, but you understand the importance of mission planning and you see who does it well and who doesn't. So that's a gift. But the other part is when you have people and you start chatting on SAT 102, you talk about the JTACs and the CCTs, uh, the, the, 
and tack piece. It's really the tack yeah. piece. It's really nice when your first time on the radio on Sat 102 in front of like an entire theater isn't when you're the one receiving fire. Right. Yeah. And when you said that about those guys, it was like I always thought. I thought to myself, like you know, they always seem to act like they've been there before. Because chances are they've been there before. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know what their first call looks like, but even before they get there, they've been on the radio and dropped so many bombs at so many different times yeah. in so many different locations that there is that second nature piece to them. Yeah. And uh, I have such admiration oh, yeah, for me too. AFSOC and, to mm -hmm. begin with. Um, but it's like you said, so when you're down on the ground, you do set a tone. And also, too, you know, what's the battalion commander thinking when he hears a O three or E seven like breaking on the radio and communicating a nine line horribly? Yeah. Like you're being evaluated every time you yeah. you know, hit the key yeah. to send. So it's interesting that you brought that and, up. And it also like it also matters around indige, right? Because even if they don't understand what you're saying, they're taking cue off they how you're saying it. hundred yeah. percent. You know. Um so what cause you to go back in to the military because now we're it's 2007 2008 yes precisely yeah and like we're deep in it now people thought it would be over by now yeah right and um to that point it was getting to be this idea that last chance coming up right like 2007 2008 like you better get down range if you're planning on it because this is wrapping up you know and what had happened is my friend and uh uh, really just a, again a brother uh, Mark uh, came up to me and he uh, he was driving through town and I had said you know this is before like cell phones were so commonplace like 2000 like we used them we were texting but Blackberries were still in play right like let's be realistic like it wasn't this you know communication tool we didn't have wicker or signal or anything like that right. WhatsApp and uh, he was driving through my town and he had said to me he was like uh, he's like hey uh, I, I don't know if he called me on cell or he might have shot me an email, but he asked me to meet him at this restaurant we had gone to in Milford, Connecticut. So I met him there and he had said to me, um, my unit was originally in Newport, Rhode Island. And he said to me, um, do you remember, you know, you told me if I was ever taking a team to Afghanistan, you would enlist and go with me. And I said, well, it sounds like something I would say drunk at the Pelham. Right. And he goes, we were, in fact, at the Pelham, which <laughs> universally meant we were drinking. Right. Whether it was the, the first sentence of the night or not would probably decide as to whether or not we were inebriated. Um, but uh, it was such a no-brainer for me. He was just one of the best people I know. And I always went back to this thing where it was anything that was good about me in my life, anything that was good about me was because of these men. And anything that was shitty about me was in spite of their best efforts, mm -hmm. right? And I believe that firmly. And here's a person that has never asked anything of me, and he wasn't begging me, but he wanted me to go on a deployment, and I didn't want him downrange without me. Mm -hmm. I believed in my skill set and my friendship, and I, I, so I think I started, I think I called a recruiter the next day um, or the day after, whatever it was. I don't want to pump myself up but it was within a day or somebody two. fact check this yeah I'm seriously i can't have the recruiters yeah. gonna be yeah. writing in the comments yeah. Yeah. Really. it was yeah, four right. months <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh you know very quickly enlisted and uh, re-enlisted took a reduction in rank and um you know was gratefully um you know reassigned without uh, my security clearance um had to be resubmitted and everything had oh, to be wow. done but uh, still had the copy of the old one. That's how we used to do it back then. So yeah. all the answers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah, the same. yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm not so going to put that. I remember I lived at another address, but I'm not going to put it on the. Well, SA now you can just reach this. out to the Chinese because they have it all. <laughs> yeah, so many After advantages the, the analog era. Yeah. <laughs> so we um, so I did, and I I reenlisted, and um, within a few weeks or months or whatever, began spinning up, and that was when I went to the. Uh, um, the combat trackers program. Like, I think honestly, I believe there was like a, we need to get you officially on board so we can cut orders so you can go next Friday. Right. Like it was that quick. And I left and I went to that, uh, that combat trackers program and on in Huka, which was amazing. And then began sort of a, back to the old life of almost being a PMT guard bum where it was like I went to that course, I went to a sniper recall, I went to you know a few different a Safauk, few different schools, and then um, our official PMT started, 
you know, so we did our pre-mission training up until January of 09. And um, January, I think January 3rd of 09, I went to Bragg for some more long gun training. And January 10th, the unit had already deployed like right after Christmas, right before the first of the year. So unit was forward in Bagram. They hadn't gone anywhere yet, but we stayed back for long gun training. And then we flew over and uh, rejoined with our teams. And that was in January of 2009. So after living the cushy, like, soft, fat, and happy life, I'm just kidding. So happy. Like, w was, what was it like going back into the military after, after sleeping on a real yeah. bed and, you know, setting you know, your own schedule? So what happens is, and it, maybe this just happened to me, but between 2005 and 2009, the dynamics changed to what it meant to be a Green Beret. It leaned way more heavily into this kinetic space. The DA, yeah. The vernacular changed. Mm -hmm. The radios, the 60 went to the 240. Like so many of these mm -hmm. different things happened. Mm -hmm. So you actually show up, and I would imagine if I was other people that didn't know me on the team, they were probably like, this guy sucks. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't inaccurate. Right, like you, there's an entire catalog of things that evolve in that short compressed yeah. period yeah. of time yeah. that you had to relearn everything. Like it was still a nine line, right? But there was some fundamental elements that had changed within it's it. It's tactical, but also cultural. You Culture. know, the the change yeah. that you, 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 like the very but... yeah, very different. It's yeah. very different, almost a different service, and we saw it to some extent in yeah. the call too. You know, like the word yeah. operator. When I went through the Q course, the word operator was yeah. exclusive to guys on the other side of the fence. Right. Period. Right. And then when, and I remember very distinctly, this kid said to me, he's like, yeah, Grant, you know, this guy's an operator. And I was like, well, and again, he's over the fence. And he's yeah. like, no. I was like, well, what do you mean he's an operator? He's like, an operator like us. And I was like, I'm not an operator. I'm an operator now? Yeah. I'm yeah. Operator now. This is amazing. Yeah. And, you know, um, <laughs> got yeah. I did nothing. Yeah. And my skill sets deteriorated. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of an awakening for me. And it took a bit to outwork those cultural, as you brilliantly pointed out, and some of the tactical deficiencies, even acronyms. We didn't call them TTPs. I know people are like, mm. sweet. There is different language used yeah. for every single thing. A con Pre Pre-combat inspections, PCIs. PCIs. Like, yeah. Uh, right. all, all these things. PMCS can, was yeah. what we noticed. Yeah. And then there was um, the con op. We didn't have a con op. Con we had a yes. five paragraph. Yeah. yeah. Right. So SMIAC. <laughs> exactly. Right. So all of these things changed so drastically. So I paid a bit of a price for that. And that was something you had to like humbly work through. Yeah. Um, and then that all changes. You know, you get in a firefight and you perform well. And then everybody. Right. Saying, then it doesn't so, matter. Doesn't care. You know. Yeah. Um, These are radios alone. The, the, the radio down to the individual operator. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's all kinds of things that changed. Crypto. So quickly. So quickly. But yeah. it changed. It wasn't just enabling communication it changed the way things were run blue force tracker yeah yeah right all of these different things and systems and it wasn't enough for your camo guy to know blue right. force tracker right every single person had to know every single person had to be able to load crypto into right. the radios and the yeah. vehicles like all of these things and it was a ton and very candidly if pmt was the place for you to master all this you were fairly screwed yep too much And we haven't even talked about all the counter ID bullshit that you had to learn about on the, yeah. the technical as well as the tactical stuff, the TTPs, yeah. yep. which we're, we're all consuming. Yeah. yeah, I left my team for two weeks to go through the Crows weapons mm -hmm. training and then came back to a team that had been patrolling and training on ranges for two weeks together. It was like, once again, I was the outlier. So yeah. I had this skill. For, you know, and then what happens first, we get our Afghanistan, we got, you know, Humvees. <laughs> so, yeah, that's <laughs> right. know. And then we would eventually yeah. get the weapon systems. But, like, you pay a price for that. But if you're yeah. the junior Bravo, you're the guy going to the Crows weapons training. Right. Right. So there was incredible learning for it. But all of that came at a pretty solid price for me. Right. Like, there, and just personally, like, a harder lift than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect I had to reestablish my reputation 
at 34 years of age right. after being a rock star when I left, or right. at least in my head a rock right, star. Right, right. I think people right. would argue that point, but... mentioned in your own lunchtime. Yeah, yeah. All right. but at least certainly being a physically and uh, technically and tactically competent person sure. when I got out, and then coming back to be like... Yeah, yeah. Now, now you feel like you're struggling a little bit to right. tread water. And like, think of how there. Safauk evolved. Right, there right. was no Savauk when I Savauk when I left, and now the way that you enter a room, we called it CQB, and the mm. way that you're entering a room, and the the button hooks that you're taking, and right. the zones that you're clearing are now completely changed. And you got a, you got guys on a team that are legitimately are like, I thought you said this guy was great. Yeah, yeah. To the yeah. guy that asked you to come. Yeah, you know. So I didn't anticipate having to work that hard to regain credibility. Yeah, yeah. and to some, I I probably didn't. Yeah, you know, some probably like ah, forty. You'll probably get some comments, but whatever. Now, <laughs> it, it, had you? Uh, so you were the junior Bravo at this time. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, what was it? Was there a transition for you? You know, going from civilian life, was it jarring going from civilian life back into military life? Incredibly so. And the reason was, you know, I knew how to run a code. I knew how to save lives. At this point, I was. To charge nurse every shift that I was working. I was a well respected person. All right. Now if my MOS was medical, right, I would have been golden. Okay. But there were moments like when we would do LTT or when we would do when we get IV access and stuff like that, people would see a little bit of a glimmer of somebody that had I mean, I had more needle sticks than anybody right any ten deltas at that point in time. And it's not because I was so awesome. I just worked in a busy emergency room in yeah. Bridgeport, Connecticut. And that's what they do to you when you first start. They're like, Go go get IV access mm. for the next ten shifts and you blow out veins until you get it. But if I had a medical driven MOS, but because I had a weapons driven MOS not a lot of spig nines in, yeah. in uh no, Bridgeport. Not a lot. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things about that was, you know, there's camo guys that are really into guns. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And they have these skill sets. And there was camo guy. There was, you know, different guys. Like there was an engineer that was a professional mm -hmm. armorer. Right. So you have this skill set that's mm -hmm. less than the job that you're supposed to be in, even though you have all this other skill sets that you can bring to the table if right. need be. I had the long gun skill, which is always helpful. Um, and I was a person that would never leave your side. And I think people appreciated that. And I carried more than my weight. Yeah. Mm. you know on purpose to to be that yeah. person and i tried to work harder not always successfully we had some hard working guys on the team but it's an interesting though steve what, what you're talking about we can all relate to right away like wanting that. to be accepted by the team yeah that visceral desire right then it never leaves you and then back to the village yeah. yeah yeah because what is the shelf life of your existence if you're thrown out of the village and if you're in afghanistan and you're the least liked member of an 11 or 12 man team yeah it's a shitty existence. Life it's is hard. Scary. Life existence. is hard. Yeah. It's an upregulated existence. Yeah. 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 Right. And that's why, I, uh, which is vicious circle, because the more upregulated you are, the shittier you become. The less proficient the, the you are. Hard, yep. Yeah. The harder it is to to fit in. So, so you guys deployed, and you deployed to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. right? And where did you guys go initially? So, um, well, as I said, I went to Bakram to be an AST for right. a few weeks, and then we were down in uh, Camp Airborne, Wardak. And um, that was when, and uh, a place called Metalam. We were split uh, in the Jawas Valley. So there was a group at Camp Airborne, and then there was a group training the AP3 program out at uh, uh, Metalam, um, which was a fairly beautiful area. It was a beautiful area. It was a fairly calm area for a while. But then by the time we would leave um, Jawas, it would. Uh, the three at, at one point in time it was the three highest casualty months of any area in uh, all of rc east um and that was um may june and july uh april may and june of 2009 it just sort of yeah much more. yeah uh and it happened quick really quick um we weren't the victims of it the kids that were co-located with us in the 10th mountain um mm -hmm. were getting lit up and again, couldn't love and like and respect those those kids yeah. Yeah. anymore. They ran the gunfire. They were QRF. They were great, hardworking human beings. And uh, we would watch their vehicles getting pulled up on low boys with, with all too high frequency. 
Um, so that was interesting. So when you were out there, was that was, was your initial tasking for the the police yeah. program? Yeah, the AP three program, um, and it was a high level, like it was highly visible, right? Because they were recognizing the fact that um, in a very Klaus Witzian model, that unless we stabilize things internally, then we're not getting out of Afghanistan and we took I, t I personally took pride in the mission because it was like if we're going to do this right we're going to be one of the few jobs here where the work and the mission like we stood up the school for it we didn't yeah. just stand, we didn't just stand up a battalion we stood up the school to produce um so it was like if you did it right one you could go outside the wire anytime you wanted and you could do some great work and sort of the collateral missions that come very naturally to special operations folks um but then the work would endure when we left in August, uh -huh. right? And that I took pride in. Um, and we told ourselves that was the exit strategy, which it should have been. Could have been. And could have yeah, been, could have probably, been. Yeah. right? Yeah. Depending Given on the, the, the political heft. headspace. Yeah. yeah. Like if, that, if the appropriate resources and heft were put mm. into that, and then the appropriate accountability was put into it, I, I think it was yeah. a winning strategy. What, what resource? Did you guys did you guys have to develop the curriculum? Did they send like civilian law enforcement in with you? Did NDS come in? Yeah. How, how did that all come together? Um, I'd be speaking sort of inaccurately on it because it was handled by other people. Okay. Today. So I wouldn't really. So um, the schoolhouse was established. There was a separate line of effort that was established towards it. Mark, who asked me to go in the first place, was the one that was kind of ripped out and overseeing the logistical piece. And that was literally like buying boots, uniforms, and like yeah. issuing these things and 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 all of that. And then um, the um, training piece started with, I believe it was my team, and then there were some other uh, – U.S. partner forces that were, I think, an ad hoc group that was put together. Um, there was even some um, lawyers, like J JAG officers, that were involved uh -huh. in the legal aspect of mm -hmm. things. It was I mean, warrant-driven. The, the theory was it was going to be warrant-driven arrests, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, well, that and community policing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the idea was we were pulling these folks out of their villages. They were being trained in a central location in Medellin. A teams were deployed to keep security in their absence, and then they would be redeployed to their villages with their partner force A team. So they were coming from all over the country then for this? All, okay. all over the RC. Oh, yeah, fascinating. All over the area. Yeah. So, um, and that was bad. Yeah. It's it was tough, a, right? It was tough to keep them there. It was hazardous. It was risky, uh -huh. right? So if you were an 18 or 19 year old guy with a couple sisters in Kabul, and now you're working for the Americans. You're putting your family at some element of risk. Yeah. Um, so a great distance would have been better. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like if we were pulling them from, you know, Helmand right. and vice versa, I think there would have been some safety in that anonymity. Mm. Yeah. Um, but that's not how it went. And I don't know why it didn't go that way. Like these things seem all reasonable to us, right? Like, oh, just take them from Helmand. But there's complexities there that I, I wasn't part of that I'm certain were. We, we didn't present. ask the right questions, I think. You know, in planning a lot of this, yeah, of the of the people that we were working with, you know, and, and it also like it seems, you know, it, it seems uh, streamlined to bring people from that area in and train them there. It's just that you're right that that there's no anonymity. So as soon as they're there training, probably everybody who was there w was yeah singled out. And I bet mm -hmm. it's one of those things. Where like, and I'm not accusing anybody of anything here, but I bet it briefed beautifully. Right. Mm. Like right. When, you know, and they're like, and this force will go here. And like, right. I bet it was like laid out and every six months we're going to produce another 500 and whatever. And, and, and in 10 years, we're going to have a 38,000 person. And there was probably even a graph that had like one person multiplying to oh, two we, to four. We, to, we won right. the war. We won the war every six months by PowerPoint. Yeah. Yep. But you know what I mean? Like, it was yeah. probably this great thing where it's like, this is the plan. We yeah. are doing this. Yes. Right. Yeah. Step one, bring <laughs> in five, bring five. in recruits. Step two, question mark. Step three, profit. Yeah. 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 Um, 
So what, in addition to training these guys, eventually they stood, like, were you taking them out on the economy or were you taking yeah. them out as part of the training? Yeah. So um, they went through the training and we had to teach some of these guys how to drive and some of them how to drive stick. Mm -hmm. Like that's the level, right? Um, mm -hmm. So the training was more challenging than I think we had anticipated. The time to proficiency was more challenging, right? And then... Um, we would go out with them, uh, getting them mo motivated to act of their own accord was challenging. So they need to be watched, mm -hmm. which I don't know that would be any different here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like uh, there's a reason there's shift supervisors yeah. and sergeants and patrol right. sergeants. That's right? right. So we had assumed that role, which put us on the roads a lot. We were constantly outside the wire, just constantly. Mm. Um, how was it you guys were avoiding like the IED threat and everything that we don't know we don't know and we've had the conversation mark my team sergeant fantastic guy was a police officer um i think it might have been the beards i think it might have been the posture mm -hmm. and i think it might have been sort of this like calculated decision on the part of the other side mm -hmm. where it's like well we'll take some heat but probably not this much heat yeah, yeah. whereas if they kill 40 percent of an oda right right like i i think that was what because it certainly wasn't skill i mean i'd love to say it was but right we, but we know better right it's, it's random when it happened when that stuff the, yeah but what you just mentioned um i listened to uh oh gosh i remember this moment uh name in a moment but a regular warfare podcast and and uh, it, the, the question was, what makes the unit good or bad at counterinsurgency? What makes the unit better? And he didn't say, you know, the answer wasn't, well, they really need to practice, you know, yeah. this and that. It was humility. Un understanding that you probably don't know what's going on yeah. and being comfortable with that. Yeah. But, you know, so, so what you just described, you described it very well. And you, you said, look, there were dynamics going on. Yeah. That, that enabled our survival. Now, nine out of 10 right. guys would have said, yeah, well, we were really careful and we did this and that, but yeah, and that they would never have accepted, well, the Taliban let us live. We don't yeah, know why they let fun. us live, yeah. Yeah. but there was a reason and it probably wasn't anything we were doing or not doing. It was just, that's what happened. Yeah, it, it, it had to be yeah. a calculation, yeah. you know, and we got into a few ticks where we... Um, we were somewhat relentless, right? I know yeah. like it wasn't an easy day for yeah. him. So um, I don't know how to say it. It sounded weird or it sounded like... The, no, you, you, you got it. You, we, you got we, it we pursued it to the point that yeah, we couldn't right. pursue they, it They knew there was right. going to be a cost. They right. knew there was yeah. going to be a price, right. a cost, or, an, or a oh, seriously long inconvenience. Yeah. Like, right. Um, so I think that disproportional reaction offered us some... Because we were the only AD, uh, ODA on those two MSRs, yeah. MSR mm -hmm. Montana, and I can't remember the other one. Um, so I would say that um, that was probably part of the calculus. But that only takes you so far. You pack yeah. a culvert. Right. Right. And if they think they can get everybody, well, that right. doesn't Absolutely. really matter. Yeah. So, uh, but I think that probably went into yeah. it. How, you know, how did you uh, train these guys? Because that's a very unique situation, being both law enforcement but being in law enforcement in a semi-permissive environment, so they have to have some infantry skills too, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, not just infantry, but like some room, like house, house, like, um, how would those guys respond in a tick? Yeah. Not Our interpreters responded better than those individuals, truly. And uh, I'm not disparaging them. I, I don't know, maybe it was a training issue. Um, I, I think that, um, there was a group of individuals that are very much committed to the cause. And I think there was a group of individuals there that were very much committed to a paycheck Yeah, and sort of working both sides of it where yeah. it's like, yeah, I'm wearing the uniform, but don't worry, bro. I got your back yeah. kind of thing, you know? So, um, getting people to do things of their own accord. So really i think what happened is it evolved to the position where it was like okay we could have them as a presence patrol or uh they can serve a valuable purpose as a early warning mm -hmm. you know they've got radios and they've got interpreters and we've got 
the ability to dispatch more forces there mm -hmm. um, that could work with some of the different can decks and the different you know infantrymen in the, in the area that mm -hmm. Afghan mm -hmm. you know uh, forces so I, I think they served what I would define as a community watch mm -hmm. right which isn't the worst thing mm -hmm. you know um, I think it would have been good to yeah. call them that Mm -hmm. And then maybe scale back the training yeah. and scale back the presence and even disarm. You know yeah. what I mean? Like if they're armed, now they're a target. Yeah. And, right. And I think to even, you know, put them. The one thing I'd just say is there would always seem to be this um, unwillingness that Americans and Brits and Aussies and, you know, sort of have. There always seemed to be this unwillingness of like going to the map. You know, where it's like, there was some, you know, and like I said, my interpreters, they, they would throw it what, out. What do you mean by going to the mat? You mean like, following through? On? Like going out to kill bad guys. Oh, right. Like yeah, this yeah. sort of of their own accord, like bullshit. Yeah. This is my town. This is my community. Like oh, you're they not going to take it. They, they you, lacked it. You're saying they lacked the same willingness that, that the other, that the U.S. and, yeah. and yeah. other forces had. I see. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, and on our own soil and our own histories, and maybe that's part of our histories. Yeah. yeah. You know, maybe they, um, I mean, we, listen, I'm sorry. We proved them right. Yeah. They told us and warned us that we were going to leave them hanging and we swore to them that we were not. Right. And we did. Right. I mean, yeah. so uh, wh where's who my... Wrong? Yeah, who was right. wrong? Yeah. Right? Where's my argument here? So maybe they were strategically playing it because they had a better sense of how it would go and they weren't blinded by the optimism and the faith that, that some of us had. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think they always, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think you're absolutely right, Steve. I... I think, you know, even they probably, even if they didn't have the prescience at strategic level to realize what a cock out we were going to make of Afghanistan, yeah. they knew despite our best intentions, we were there for a limited period of time. And they knew the continuity of the Taliban, you know, and it was, it went way beyond what was going on then. And it was so embedded in their culture and their history. Right. It, it was almost intuitive for them. The long game. Not to work with us. Yep. Um, and, or, I mean, or in, in fairness, they, you know, put on the, put on a, a brave face to it but sure and every and, time we proved them right right the yeah. less we did the less they did the more we up resourced yeah. right we didn't right. we didn't start off spending x dollars a year and then taper down no. right no. <laughs> right <laughs> it was same thing in iraq oh right all right so why aren't you out on patrol we don't have we don't have any gas Shit, we've got gas for you. Yeah. <laughs> instead yeah. of right. Yeah. Instead of realizing you wonder, it was a face saving. Yeah. Right. And you wonder what happened with the demilitarization in Iraq and the impact that that then had in the ability to solidify the ground force in Afghanistan. We can't yeah. be like, oh, they had no idea. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it was also, you know, we have, you know, we had this sort of naive idea also of of what democracy meant to them and and. Any, I, you know, any, in, in their idea of what nationalism was, you know, in, in terms of we never, at, at a policy level, I think that a lot of, you know, Marine soldiers, people on the ground knew, but on a policy level, we, we never appreciated that they were, and for re good reasons for them, but way more concerned what happened with their village and their tribe yeah, than what needs. happened in Kabul, which was, you know, which was two mountain ranges, you know, which was so far away because the roads weren't even paved in, in so many places. You yeah. know, it was it was an, it's another place for them. And I've always thought about this piece of it, too, which is rather unpopular. So probably should say it on a podcast no go ahead. no you absolutely should it. this this podcast <laughs> i discovered yes. is a great forum for unpopular statements yeah, perfect well then i'm gonna yeah. fit right in but it's like can we get on board with the fact that they weren't buying what we were selling right, right. like so in other words we're like freedom right and that is critically important to us like I'll go guns up in a minute if I think things in the world are going the wrong way in terms of like personal liberty or the protection right. of my children right so but if you look around most of the world, there's a Survival. pretty solid acceptance of this, like, sort of relative subjugation, right? Like, yeah. you know, like, I don't need all the freedom as long as some of this other stuff over here is taking care Security. of. Security. 
right? Like, I don't need to be a hero. I don't need to be able to do whatever I want. I just kind of need to be able to do most of what I want right. in my little sphere. Right. And I think that was where we went wrong because we were expecting them to go down swinging. Like, we were, I mean, we were more willing to go to a gunfight in many times than they were. Mm -hmm. Right, and we were had this, we, we were always shocked. We're like, "How could you not?" And they're like, I, "I can't get killed for a cause right now. I'm taking care of my two sisters." Right, you know. And we mm. never. I feel like I didn't. I'll just say we, instead of saying we all the time. I didn't understand that until years after the conflict. Yeah, I didn't understand it. I started working. With, I was one of the early on on the uh, task force pineapple, and then um, another effort called uh, Operation Liber. We raised some money, got some people out. But it wasn't until those moments where I got that reflective about the um, error in our strategy. Yeah. Like we we putting our, I mean, you could plan logistically, but to then sort of project our ideals onto somebody. I there, I mean, there were those those elements in Afghanistan. There were Afghani's, you know, or Afghans who went hard. Mm -hmm. um, But, but I feel that they were. It, it was a limited group. It was. It was, was that nationalism driving that though, or was it their own personal ethical code? I think it was their own personal ethical right. code. I don't necessarily think they were fighting for a free Afghanistan. They were fighting for a free, you know, Jalalabad or a free, you know, mm -hmm. they they were oh. fighting for. They were fighting against. You know, Taliban. Right. They were in, and and in some cases fighting. They were fighting because that's that was ingrained in their, you know, in their background. Yeah. They heard the they, tales of their grandfathers yeah. killing the Russians. Yeah. And even and to their the point great when we were, fighting the British and the, yeah. yeah. And even to the yeah. point, you know, you'd give them a CZ and you'd see the disappointment. You know, they wanted the AK, like you know, and you would see the disappointment when you handed them the yeah. It, you know, so. I don't know. I mean, I'm talking a lot here, but like, what did you find most shocking about? Well, it's your show. I mean, the, well, the, the, nobody I, wants to hear. Her. But you Maybe. know what I mean? Like, that was the thing that I found the most shocking of that lack of will. Like, you're not buying what we're selling, and how could you not? Like, free freedom's awesome. Like, you know, this idea that we're pitching this. And it is a relative thing. Like, it's critically important to me. I couldn't exist without it. But that's how we were raised. But people that are basically really trying to feed their family and get through a winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, yeah. I, I mean, you know, for a lot of for a lot of the, you know, Afghan Americans that like went back as interpreters who would tell us stories about when they left and, and for like a lot of the Afghans um, who who I who like fought hard and, you know, risk their lives every day um like the taliban was was bad uh you know the taliban you know would treat women horribly horribly and you know would would you know like their vice and virtue cops would just do horrible things if a mother was holding her adult son's hand because they it was a man and a woman holding hands in public um, you know, a lot of them, like, they knew it and th they weren't, you know, like I said, I, I don't think they were fighting for a high idea like freedom or democracy. They were fighting for their village, for their town, their city, for self determined you know, they didn't want the Taliban to, to roll through. You know, they didn't care about a national government in Kabul, <laughs> but they cared about what happened locally. Right. I, I think one of the things I, had, I was struck with was they weren't fighting for freedom. They were fighting for a lack of oppression. Right. And those are two different things. Very different things. Right. Like, and I think that is where... And they, and they would accept lesser oppression... But if they if they could if they could guarantee the safety of their family or the or they, the, the next meal, how many needed. nights do you hear a toddler cry for for hunger, 
before you're willing to do anything to mm. alleviate their discomfort. Right. Right. Throw in community health, throw in antibiotics, all of the things that should be available. And that's what made the thing so damn heartbreaking. Right. Like you get to this certain point and, you know, there was a comment. One of the politicians, I, I honest, um, one of the. I can't think of who it was. I'm not talking about the, 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 the Donald Trump comment, but there was a comment made last week where it was something like, um, generally speaking, I think it's a good idea that we all stop fighting wars for a while. Like, that's such an honest, sincere sentiment of, like, whether it's in, the Ukraine, in Ukraine right now or wherever it is, there's children walking in the streets. Can we really not get this right at this point? Yeah. yeah. Like, in this day and age... And if we look at like where we're sending money, right? Two point two trillion for Afghanistan or something like that. And mm -hmm. if it's anything like the government accounting Right. <laughs> right. Let's, let's be realistic. Yeah, hey right. uh, billions. Right. So yeah. we're talking like, you know, what happens if you take that two point two children tr trillion that we spent, combined with the Brit money, combined with NATO, combined with all of these different things, all the ISAF effort, and you took that what's the impact that has on researching Malaria, um, childhood cancer, yeah. eradicating malaria, um, sickle cell anemia. Like, what could we do with that same effort, that same heft mm -hmm. that we put into and then abandoned in Afghanistan over two decades? Mm -hmm. The money and the effort and the brain power and uh, the societal load, you know? Astonishing. Yeah. All right. And at the end of the day, you would have a winning body count. That's right. With like malaria, right. where it'd be like yeah. you saved sixty thousand children's right. lives versus right. lost X number of. You know, the thing is though, is that, like in retrospect, it was. We threw away money, or whatever. However. Like having fought n with Afghans and mm -hmm. and and, you know, knowing them. Uh, some of them, you, you know, as friends, and and it, it's it's also that if we would have, it, it, if the U.S., if our government, which our government policy wise is horrible at fighting wars, there, you know, and, and you know, um. If there would have been a different outcome for Afghanistan, if if we would have withdrawn because they had stabilized and, you know, and everything was fine, they had repelled the Taliban or or we had carved out, you know, uh, you know, the Pashtun, given the Pashtun tribal areas, their own their own sort of country and said, Look, you're not Afghanistan, you're not Pakistan. You guys are you guys. You know, th this is Afghanistan or whatever. <laughs> like if there would have been a different outcome, I don't feel like we'd be asking these questions because the quality of life, you know, when you have an element in a country that's burning down schools with girls, with the girls inside and beheading people in soccer stadiums and stoning women to death because, you know, they mm -hmm. because they did the wrong thing, it's um, and, and again, we never went to Afghanistan to stop any of that stuff. Right. Right. We went there to yeah. to to destroy Al Qaeda and we did that. And so we won that we war. Then we started another war yeah. against the Taliban. But what is it that we're not makes started, us, but continued? I guess. But what the heck is it that makes us think? So. I understand going to wreck al-qaeda or taliban or whatever right. it's got to be like i get that you know it's a retribution it's you can't do that to the united states and there's right a, there's a need for that right but i actually am in more i am maybe it's my age or I'm a stage in life i'm more comfortable right now going to war for humanitarian reasons yeah. versus strategic objectives yeah. right because we yeah. don't seem to be really good at, at prioritizing at our strategic, strategic objectives, objectives. And, and, and 100%. The, thing, the thing is I've, the problem oh go ahead I'm no gonna... no no i was just saying i I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, the the deployment that, strangely enough, still, I feel, I mean, two deployments in my life, and it's not about me, uh, seemed still unambiguous, morally, my first and my last. My first was in Mogadishu. But, yeah, Mogadishu turned into 
the shit show. But initially, it was for humanitarian reasons. Mm -hmm. right. We didn't have strategic. And I felt great about that. Right. Last deployment was counter ISIS. I felt good about that deployment too. Sure. Right. Know, it was very right. um, clear cut, but it was Islamic State was not an existential threat to the United States. If you'd looked at it purely in strategic, you know, to, I mean, I mean, I, but yes, I'm agreeing with you 100%, 100% as I look back. Right. Because we go through all these mental gymnastics to show that things are U.S. or not U.S. interests. And in the end, it turns out Afghanistan wasn't. <laughs> well, and, and yeah, and and thing is, is from a humanitarian, from from the from what like what I'm saying, from the humanitarian view, like, you know, like making these people lives better for a while. And, you know, people can talk about the cost of war and, you know, the the the. Afghan suffering and the Iraq suffering. Um, but if you weren't there, like talking to Iraqis and Afghans who very much wanted these things, you know, and it, it's like, th this isn't just like, you know, white imperialism or American imperialism and these poor brown people, like, like we were there with them. Right. It, and, you know, if we went to war for humanitarian reasons, I mean, there are so many countries in the world, right, to go to war with for those reasons. It's, we made a mistake, I think, after ejecting AQ. Like, we went there to kill Al-Qaeda. We did that. We did that fast. Uh, and then we developed this prolonged war with Taliban, still using sort of the same template for al-qaeda but but the taliban wasn't al-qaeda they they weren't foreigners on the soil right right they they were benign they were not benign but so it's so to your point where there were finger pointers at the taliban like they knew what was happening and what or finger pointers at al-qaeda right right they mm. many afghans were mortified by what took yeah. place so there was that and as the Taliban became members of their own community, and you know, when the Taliban, and I think all of you know more than I do about this topic, and probably 99% of the listeners, but the Taliban initially were a moderate stabilizing force against criminal activity. In the 90s, yeah. In the 90s, yeah. It's, they, they offered justice. They offered justice when mm. I think two or three young women were horribly attacked. Yeah. And that was the beginning of a thing where it was like, people taking back their own community yeah. mm -hmm. and that went wrong because we know nature loves a vacuum mm -hmm. and but that was the genesis of it so mm -hmm. it sort of came into power and then morphed like any dictatorship right mm -hmm. yeah but the immediate they offered justice which you know security call it what you will al-shabaab and somalia some areas similar kind of thing you know sharia courts your, your daughter is insulted. I mean, your son's insulted. Your daughter's attacked or whatever. Right. You, what are you going to do? Go to the police or are you going to go to right. the local Taliban leader right. who's he's not going to fuck around. He's going to take care of it. Right. It's interesting. The IRA did the same thing. Right. In in uh, Catholic areas in Northern Ireland, drug dealers and all that got kneecapped. You know, it, it was... Uh, yeah. Well, they, but the right. mafia, you pay, yeah. you pay protection, right? You pay protection so that your shop doesn't get burned down, but while you, and, and it's horrible, I'm not like justifying it, but while you're paying protection, if your shop gets robbed, it's, there's going to be a remedy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and for all the listeners, we're not suggesting. No, no this is no not at all. But, but <laughs> not, this not, is how yeah. this studio has, has, is still here after. Yeah, I agree. Running, and no, yeah, but we, what we we're saying protection. is real, because if you consider like, you know, no one touched, like you said, the protected businesses, right? And not that that's not that extortion is ever acceptable, but it shows the need for some type of structure, right? In an, in any type of in, community. in an unstructured community where yeah. where there isn't right like a uh, strong sort of civic or civil, you know, yeah, uh, structures. And the Taliban, yeah, they did that, and then then they. Well, like most initial founders, they were deemed to not be radical enough, right? right? And then they were removed, right? And then you had a lot of the Salafist, you know, uh, influence yeah. and stuff. Um, so, 
so you did that trip. Like, how did you feel when you finished that trip? Like, you finally got your war on, right? And yeah. and for people who haven't been there, I think one of the worst feelings in the world would have been to have been in the military during war, to, to have been in a special operations unit, particularly during a war, and not having gotten your war on. Absolutely. Well, you, you know, you, you, um, right. So the saying is, if not me, then who, right? Like, right. So mm -hmm. you, you don't want war, but if there is a war, you want to participate and you want to do well. Right. Um, so I was glad to have had that experience, but as most of us, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. Right. So that led to sort of the reclassing in the 18 Fox space, you know, and beginning that additional route to try to begin deploying um, in a different way. And, and can you tell us what is the 18 Fox? So um, Special Forces Intel Sergeant. And um, it is someone specifically trained to use all source intelligence at a, at a team level um, and to, uh, to some degree, collect and disseminate information upward to help inform a battlefield that is being shaped in line with whatever strategic objectives lie, strategic objectives are set. Um, so you get a very decent analytic framework to work from. Um, uh, let me just say, you get a decent analytic framework and you begin to understand some of the different um, technical pieces that go into that data collection as well as uh, you know, topography like ArcGIS and even things like you're learning you use Google Earth in different ways. And um, you really do become very proficient at understanding a certain climate, not meteorologically, but the, the climate on the ground and how that climate on the ground is likely to impact and affect the commander's intent, right? So that's what, that's what you know, it's six months of that learning it. And a lot of it is you know, really poorly written <laughs> intel in sums and, you know, depending on when they're due, you know, put a put a due date on Monday morning at eight o'clock and I'm going to challenge how awesome the work is going to be. Um, but that was the Special Forces Intel course. But I liked it. It certainly suited me more than being a weapons guy. Uh -huh. um, and I didn't want to do the medic piece of it. I just didn't want to. I'd done a lot of it, you know? Right. And um, I, I think that was a good call. And then, you know, I had the opportunity for uh, going to the um, Applied Physics Lab, the SOAIC. And uh, that was eye-opening. That was a completely new way of thinking um, about the key dynamics of, of arm conflict. And the people that put that course together were brilliant. And the people I was in the class with were very, very smart and competent and educated and seasoned. I was among the younger and the least um, seasoned in the space. I had a practical piece that they lacked, and it was multi-agency. So it was very, very interesting. And uh, you got to see how other agencies did things, and you got to work with really, really decent human beings. And uh, so what does physics have to do with Intel or why, like, what was this course about at yeah. the Applied Physics Lab? Yeah, so, um, so I know this is open source, so, but I don't know how much, but the, there's been a longstanding relationship, you know, between John Hopkins and, and the sort of, I don't know what to call it. I want to say the military industrial complex, but like the DOD, mm -hmm. that sort of whole DC scene. And the Applied Physics Lab works on all sorts of different complex problems. I mean, they, there, there was an article a couple of years ago that you can Google about them, you know, shooting rockets at meteors to try to knock them off kilter. So it's a very well-funded organization that does a lot of different grants and research and, and things like that. Um, They're working on how to bring down uh, balloons high altitude <laughs> yeah <laughs> should be a really yeah <laughs> difficult one to figure yeah. out right it's just uh, a random problem <laughs> <laughs> weather balloons but um so that was the and i and i think that's just the home for it because within that there was some sort of you know sociologic capacity that they had and there's a educational structure and an accreditation process that um i think facilitated that learning and exchange of ideas so um 
physics to the extent that we learned about different technologies and things that were applied for data collection and analysis. Um, and so I think that is probably where it evolved from, probably from many decades ago. Yeah, it's fascinating. And so then after that, uh, you have other schools that you went to? Yeah, a few deployments. Uh, okay, so what, what was your next uh, deployment? Romania. Romania, okay. Yeah, Constanta. Um, we did a training mission there with um, um, the uh, Polish and Norwegian special operations groups there and um, did that and then um, worked on a different project down in D.C. after that and uh, had... Um, <laughs> began uh, building my family. And then there was one very, very somber train ride uh, down to D.C. on the Acela after like uh, a two-day weekend. And it was like this realization that you got to you gotta stop. Yeah. Like there's a cost yeah. for mm -hmm. everybody involved in this mm -hmm. and you need to figure out a different path. Yeah. And that was... Um, and what was happening is as I was doing that, we were supposed to be getting ready to deploy again um, and then the, um, cards didn't fall in the favor for that deployment. And it was like, you know what? I'm not going to go find work anymore. I'm, I'm done. And it's time to shift my focus. Were you, were you looking for one more combat deployment yes. or yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I really was. And it wasn't just that. And I think part of it was that I told you about that initial part of the skill set where it was like this learning curve for me. And I felt like I got it about halfway through mm -hmm. and now it was back and I wanted to apply it. And the other thing is with these new skills I had picked up, I became inherently more valuable mm -hmm. to any team. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to put that to use mm -hmm. for at least one deployment mm -hmm. and then see where that took me. Mm -hmm. But you ended up getting a combat deployment. I mean, it was, it was here in New York, Yeah, right? I mean, it was... It's funny the way things work out. I mean, I, I would, I would guess that validated everything you just talked about and more, more, more so perhaps than if you had gone because the, you were totally out of your comfort zone, right? Yeah, and um, well, yeah, it was different. We, um, it was a problem that there was no framework for. Yeah, right. So, and you have these like pockets of things to alleviate you want to alleviate stress you want to alleviate anxiety you want to alleviate uncertainty do, do you mind taking a second just set the problem you yeah so um what happened was um covid was evolving and emerging so it was march i want to say march 28th or 29th and one of my dearest friends and best friends in the world non-military and as i'm going through this talk with you i realize how unbelievably fortunate I've been because I kept thinking like I had a couple friends in the world but I actually got a lot a lot more than you than anyone should have you know it's a gift and this uh, friend of mine John who's uh, the uh, <laughs> he's a, a senior VP at HSS and he's the chief communications and marketing officer there and brilliant guy one of the most a hss sorry uh, for hospital that. For, yeah, yeah hospital for special surgery it's the number one orthopedic hospital in the world and we're, we're proud of it and proud of who we are and we get to i get to play a very tangential role to supporting staff that makes people's lives better every single day directly it's a, it's extraordinary um when I used to work at Bridgeport Hospital, I'd go to a cocktail party and people would bitch to me about what the terrible experience they had at Bridgeport. Now I go to a cocktail party and all I hear is how much people love HSS and how they <laughs> changed their mom and dad's life and all this. It's really quite a gift, you know. And uh, I got a call from, from John saying that um, we're about to essentially paraphrase. I'm going to connect you with the surgeon in chief, Dr. Brian Kelly, and the CEO, Lou Shapiro. Uh, both great leaders, by the way, and a woman named Laura Robbins, again. Like, I've literally worked for the top. Le uh, in my career, if you take this, like, let's call it, let's call it, like, nine great leaders I've come across that I've taken tips and things to emulate from. And uh, 
four of them I've worked for at HS. Maybe it's five. I apologize if I'm forgetting someone in the moment here under the lights. But like the majority of the great leadership I've seen actually has been at the hospital for mm -hmm. special surgery. So he called me up and he said, you know, essentially we're turning HSS into a, a COVID treatment facility and we don't know what we want you to do precisely. Wow. Um, but I'd worked with him before on some things, yeah. and he said uh, something to the effect of, we think we might be better off if you're on the team. And um, what he didn't know was at the time, I was literally in the process of like dusting off the resume to go work as a nurse in ERs in New York because the train mm. was coming down the tracks, you were see, you could, it was palpable, yeah. you know? And then just as a person and as a family, we're like, we got to get in the fight here. Mm. You know, it's what we do. Um, so it was like, how did this just happen? Like, resumes here. How yeah. Did this just and uh, so I got on the phone with um, Brian Kelly, a doctor, Brian Kelly, who's a brilliant person, athlete, friend. And uh, he was talking about what they were undertaking and what they were about to do. They stopped all elective procedures on March 16th, very heroically, for a wow. hospital that only does that, right. and began this process. That, that has a global reputation for yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is a magnet for people all over the world to come for those procedures. 100%, so, and before um, they needed to. In, in a healthcare system that's based on on uh profit yes yeah. a very brave decision very smart of you to pick up on that piece of it and it was one of those things where it was like we don't have an er we don't have other ways that revenue comes in and uh lou shapiro and dr kelly made the decision like this is the morally right that's the leadership piece i mm. talk about like they do the right thing when nobody's looking so how could i not want to work for these yeah. people you know so we had a couple conversations and they very graciously and i and i want to be clear um there was like some article written that caused some cringeworthy moments for me that sort of like painted me out to play a much bigger role than I did. HSS would have been just fine without Steve Forty. Uh, I think at one point I was haloing in, right, in one of the articles, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. like you know, um, and, and nothing could have been further from the truth. The level of intellect and competence there is extraordinary. That's what drew me to it. But I did get the. But what what did you bring to the fight? You know, you're a modest guy, but. Try not to be modest. What what did you bring yeah. that that they didn't have in house on team? So because that I, was something. Yeah. Well, I think what they didn't have was someone that had um, lived an adult life in proximity to sort of catastrophic events, mm -hmm. right? Like you know my own personal story. My mother died of an alcohol overdose. My father died of cancer. My grandfather took his own life in an alcohol induced state. Um, had been to combat and legitimately so at a, at a fairly high level. Worked in level one trauma centers. I was a nurse that could relate to the nursing staff mm -hmm. and the job that they had to perform under the conditions that they needed to perform. I had critical care experience. So there was all these little like bunch of like, the, the, the quote would, I guess, would be like for a time such as this where it's like, you know, and there was like sort of a a comment or a joke that was made where it was like, if the center would be like, we need to find we need to hire a board certified critical care nurse, right, right military combat veteran special operator intel analyst you know right. uh you know sober like it, it's <laughs> the type of it's the type of job that you can't possibly chart yourself to yeah it just you when when the job comes up they're like this is the perfect because of all these things this is the perfect person for it and um I, I don't know if I was a perfect person, but I was a person there that they had and, and said yes to. And um, we initially didn't know what the job was going to be, but at least I could, you know, enter a room and look them dead in the eye and say it's going to be all right because it always is. Right. Right. It is. Right. right we're here. Right. Because um, I've been here before and I'm promising you it's going to be all right. I don't know how. Right. But we're going to be uncomfortable together for a bit. So at a minimum, I was able to do that with some element of credibility. Yeah, and um, then also, you know, with prior to this, I I had been um, studying different fields of this, you know, down regulation piece for a very long time, just for my own unlocking. You know, I wasn't great when I came back from Afghanistan. I was fine. I was getting a job, and people liked me and respected me. Were you still drinking at that point in time? No. Okay. No. No, I had four years of sobriety under my belt at that point in time, and. Um, I had this gift of when I decided to drink, it literally was gone, like just gone. Yeah. Never mm -hmm. had the thirst again. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I'm grateful for that. And 
it was easy to say yes to after I spoke with Lou Shapiro and after I talked to Brian Kelly and Laura Robbins and these great leaders and John Engelhart. Like, I wanted to be with them. And if we went down swinging, this was as close to a deployment as it was ever going to be for me. Right. What, what niche... So you so you, you've described very well what prepared you for this, mm -hmm. and and no one can really replicate your qualifications. It was, I mean, across the board, some of which no one would want to have those qualifications. You know, very hard earned. And you talk about a period of uncertainty, right? No one really knew. No one could tell you what your role was. But talk about how how you carved out a niche for yourself. Find work. Right, we've all said that before, yeah. like find yeah. work. Yeah. So when I got to the hospital, I realized it was all these things that were in play that I thought I might be helpful with that I wasn't. Like, there are brilliant people there, like the logistics mm. supply chain, building auto, like the, these individuals had these things all in line. So I was like, all right, well, I gotta earn the right on this team somehow. And it literally became where I began walking the hospital. I was literally patrolling the hospital. And I was meeting people, and I was finding the people that weren't okay. Mm -hmm. And I started asking everybody, and everybody seemed to be fine. And then I you, started you're talking about patients or no. people? Yeah. Just people who worked in the Yeah, just people. Okay. I mean, I'd come across the occasional patient, but yeah. I wasn't giving any bedside care. But I was caring or at least supporting or trying to support the people that were providing it. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is, you know, first you, 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 you have a plan, and it's like, well, the nurses are undergoing a, a great deal of... Um, stress right now so I'm gonna to have to bring in some resources and pay attention and I'm gonna to have to advise the leadership of what we can bring in for them and then what I was finding is like you know the nurses some of them were stressed right but they kind of been preparing and you find these professions just like being a ranger or a green beret or force recon you begin inoculated begin getting inoculated to these events you have some resilience to them but you start looking at things like the environmental folks who like clean the rooms Central yeah. sterile processing that make the hospital run. None Security, of the glory. Security, yeah. right? No, the the F twenty twos were not flying up the Hudson for them. Right. Yeah. I mean, they were, but it didn't feel that way, right? Right. right. Mm. And um, here they are. And then you start talking and digging a little deeper, and you're finding, you know, um, single moms that are, you know, walking fifty five blocks because public transportation's not working or functioning or safe, mm. and they got a thirteen year old, a twelve year old, and an eight year old at home. Um, in a fourth story walk up or third story walk up in Astoria. And they're gonna be like, oh my God, like imagine. So, so it was like, okay, I can't control any of this right now. So, how can I start? So, I think what I brought to the table was that analytical framework. Right. You know, and having been in some of these situations before, and I brought the ability, or at least I tried to bring forth the ability to provide them the tools that they could use in the environment mm -hmm. to begin taking the edge off of that stress, at least make them feel like it's going to be okay. And if it was something as simply as me going into the room or sitting with them on the floor in the hallway, whatever it was. But the real interesting thing was these pockets of places, like all of a sudden our security guards, we, never, we don't have any emergency room. Right, so all of a sudden we have an emergency room that we basically fabricated to begin receiving patients. You know, all of these fundamental changes of people, and just to be able to sit with them and tell them that it's going to be okay. We um, to connect them with resources, whether it was mental health resources or meditation resources or breath work or whatever it was. And there was this part of this whole community that I became part of that we all started reaching out to one another and saying like, this worked for me here, this is working, here's a resource I found that's free. And you started round tabling all these different resources and discussions on how we can decompress the institutions until this thing ebbs. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a gift when 90 days after that, they asked me to join the, the team full time. Um, because if they didn't, I'd be looking for another deployment. <laughs> right. Yeah. But right. you created that gift. Yeah. You know, so, so that what, what you, it's very interesting. What you're talking about was probably second nature for you, right? You know, I mean, walking the hallways. I mean, you were a, you know, you were a master sergeant. Army has master sergeants, right? Yes. I'm getting it right. I've, I think it was Dave. I forget who it was. <laughs> Dave or Jack was making fun of me last time. Oh, it, my, it wouldn't my be knowledge. me. Yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be me. Anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm certain with the army, it's the air force that really messes me up. I have yeah, no tech idea. Something. I know. Yeah, yeah. Senior, anyway, whatever. Yeah. But, but my point is, so you were an NCO, walking around, kicking boxes, talking to people, 
was kind of second nature to you, solving their problems. Um, but but for a, for a lot of people at that hospital, there must have you know who were very cap- capable, very compassionate people, and yet they didn't have the time to do that. Or, or maybe it wouldn't have occurred to them because they were just overwhelmed with everything that was going on. Yeah, uh, I, I hadn't thought about it that way. I think, you know, well, I, I'll speak to my perspective. Um, I have always taken pride. I was never the lead slinger, gunslinger, badass on the team. Like, that's just not who I was. But I was generally the guy, I hope at least I was to these people, that when they were really not doing well emotionally, when they needed to share something Mm -hmm. that wouldn't go anywhere, if they needed a complex problem fixed, or really I know, and and they've said this to me, if they needed solid, like no bullshit guidance, I was the guy. Right. So I hope I fulfilled that role to some people at HSS Mm -hmm. during it, where it's a bit second nature for me to want to be helpful and care for people. The thing I like is caring for people. I like to alleviate people's stress. So yeah. that was the part that I hope I was most effective in. And if you talk to guys on my team, they would never be like, like I was a really good shot, don't get me wrong. Mm. And physically I was a problem for most people. Like, But if you said like, what's the attribute what, what was your brought, outstanding? Yeah, it'd say like he's never gonna leave your side or he's yeah. a good guy or yeah. he's an intangible or whatever. Mm. But it wasn't my, so I mean, I was a terrible soldier and I always hated the army. Like, I don't know about you, but like, I literally yeah. despise, like, I yeah. loved the individuals, <laughs> but I had this like hatred and most people get over it. Like yeah. most people get over the loss of like being disappointed by another leadership <laughs> right, failure. Right. But I'm for me, it was like the first time yeah. every time. Right. You know? yeah. like, every day is like your first day. Yeah. In the yeah. It sucks. Oh, it's brutal. And it's like, and it's always over the most like benign things where it's like, why are we in another effing airfield yeah. on that, you know, the day before Thanksgiving, right. yeah, like, can someone make a decision so we can go to Fogo to Chow right. and get a decent meal? Right. And every time I was like shocked. Right. And then like right. you know, Christmas Eve, why on earth are right. we waiting to get released? Right. You know, right. how come you couldn't tell us four days before so we could have bought airfare at a reasonable price? Yeah. But every time I was completely shocked, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think the only time I stopped being shocked was when I finally left the military. Right. Right. Because right. I think if I reenlisted, I'd be like, I cannot believe. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like I was so bad at that. What is yeah. going on? Yeah. Well, it's the same thing that yeah. always goes on. And I'd have friends that may have been like, this is, I, this I, was unexpected. I, for I, I think that's yeah. a topic of a, a, a a podcast because I've met so many guys who said that, but typically they weren't in conventional. You know, I I don't know. I wouldn't have lasted a week in the army. I don't think, and that's not hitting the army. It's just no. I, I, you know, I. I mean, you think about when you have to do a jump with it's just a conventional jump with the army. You you trust up like a turkey. You show up eight hours before. Like, right, <laughs> you like can't, a, right, right. You can't even take a piss after you've been checked. Right. I mean, it's just. You've taken something that could be fun and they make it horrible. Well, that's what the military is good for yeah. is taking the fun out of the, the coolest yeah. shit that Dive is. School. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So oh, true. you think this would be fun? Yeah. Oh, you know, jungle warfare? Ha ha. Yeah. 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 But great, no, uh, yeah. great topic. No, but, but you're right that, like, but I think that it's sort of that, that, like, I think a lot of people in the military have that love hate relationship with you know the oh my god this is just so messed up you know like yeah. and, and like you say yeah every time it's messed up it, it's sort of like if i go outside when it's rain when it's cloudy and i get upset because it rains after like the fifth time you'd think that i wouldn't be surprised by that anymore but, but that, but, but that's, but, and it's always cloudy in the military. But it's almost right? like it, a, it's, it's almost like a relationship. Yeah, where you're like, if I just show army, like not even right, the army, right. if I just show army how deeply I care about army, right. they're not going to let me right. down. Right, <laughs> and then army's like, but, sorry. But, but there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of truth in what you said, <laughs> yeah. Dave. Uh, I I can't count. You know, I still keep my hair short. So invariably, whatever airport I'm passing through, someone will come and go, hey, let me guess, Marines. And, yeah. you know, and, and it, invariably it becomes, yeah, I was in the Marine Corps. Yeah, how was it? I hated every fucking second. Yeah. Every, I hated it. How long were you in? Four years. But always afterwards, it's like, you know, I've missed it I ever miss since. It. Well, yeah. yeah. But it's like you said, it's just like, it, it, hey, Army, look at my it's PFT a store. Shared, it's a shared experience. Yeah. You're all, you're all bitching you're, and you're complaining all about it. You're all together. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Things will be different when I'm a master sergeant. Yeah. Nope. 
Yeah. You're just more frustrated and you have to now let you're more people yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now you get it from both yeah. ends. So yeah. then, the them you're bitching about keeps moving up in right, rank. Right, right. So when I was a, yeah, when I was a private, I mean, aside from, I remember looking at my battalion commander and thinking, that dude's so old. I can't imagine him even having sex with his wife. That's one, right, yeah. He had a, he had a kid and I was just, this must be, a, you know, he must have been 40 years old. And then... And then before I know it, I'm the colonel, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, these one stars and two yeah. stars. <laughs> but at that point, you're also looking at the private school, and did their mom give them yeah. permission to slip to be here? Right? Yeah. I can't no, trust him with yeah. a firearm? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 No, oh, but that's funny how, we... how you mentioned it's like a relationship, because it, 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 it is. It's, it, hey. it, you just have to agree that you're, you know, you have to accept that you're always going to be disappointed. <laughs> before yeah. that hilarious and true diversion though oh, point i want to make though i and leadership is a really hard skill you know we think of hard skills as shooting no you can teach a monkey how to shoot right, right. i mean given basic hand-eye coordination sure. yeah it, it takes people different times you cannot teach everyone leadership yeah because they need a quote end of emotional intelligence in order to take it aboard and to keep learning and progressing so getting back to the value of someone coming out of the military hundred percent that is what they offer and you just you proved it yeah you know you, we can talk about it all day but it is the truth you offer a company something that chances are no matter how brilliant their guys are whatever schools they've been to they don't know how to do that yeah i think planning which is a component of leadership yeah. right but what i get frustrated with is get i always and i've i've helped shepherd a lot of guys off of the special operations community into different ventures or grad school or try to give them good counsel you know and i think that um one of the things that makes me want to physically slam my face through the wooden table is when someone's like yeah you know i'm really good at project management yeah what the what the hell is like, that you're so much better than that. And I'm not yeah. saying project management isn't a critical yeah. task. But right? that as a qualification, but you as, must get your PMP. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah. But as if art or artistic <laughs> aspects don't exist in the military. Yeah. You know, as if creative problem solving, innovation, right. entrepreneurship, like as if these things are void. And it's like, well, I'm going to get out. And because the stereotype is that I'm going to be really organized. And let me dispel some myths to anybody like, there are some people in the military, like my friend Mark, who are extremely organized, and I know that because he used to fill out my travel vouchers for me. Uh -huh. And then there's me, yeah. where like I'm giving them like you know a box of receipts, right. and one of them's from a previous deployment, right? So uh, there Tra are traveling like a lance corporal. I was told. <laughs> I, I was told once uh, as a major. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, but it's like one of those things where the capacity for. Uh, if given the chance to step out of this area of task management where it's like, no, I'm going to make sure everybody does what they're supposed to do. Well, corrections officers do that. And that's a yeah. great profession. You know what I mean? And I'm not knocking it, but getting to that conversation of what do you want to do? What makes you happy? What brings you joy? What's going to make you engaged? Mm. Like, I understand you've been disappointed by Army for the past three decades, right, right. but let's get it's, you a career. Army's moved on. Right? Army yeah. doesn't think about you anymore. Right? You, you walk know, in. Army's with somebody. When, right, Army's right. with somebody new who's eighteen. Um, amazingly, right. and then when you walk up yeah. and you're like, "Hey, Goldman Sachs," yeah, and then you know you're yeah, like, "Now right. you got your person there, right?" right? right. Where it's like uh, you walk in and you love your job, and it's and that should be able to be a match. Yeah, I think that should be a match for most people in the world. It yeah. should be a priority. Mm -hmm. But in particular, our veterans that are going through this, in particular, ones that have a retirement that don't have to rush and jump into whatever the next thing that presents itself in, people should be pursuing these things with passion. Yeah, that go beyond like you said pmp like you literally took the words out of my mouth yeah. it's like you, that's great and if that is your passion i'll help you with it but don't let somebody yeah. tell you that that is what yeah. you're right at, right yeah or that that is the right and left limit yeah you know like oh you know it's, it, there's a lot of things that that these young men and women are so talented in doing and they should be allowed to it like even in a place like you know sergeant major they could find amazing homes at high levels of human resource management. They've been doing it yep. for a while at scale in far more critical environments, yeah. right. often far more critical environments. Mm -hmm. But those conversations, those bridges are never made. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and like we talked about, you know, before, like that takes education on both sides, right? It takes an education on the military side to know what <laughs> the what the world looks like out there. And it takes 
an education on the civilian side, knowing what, you know, what an actual soldier, sailor, airman, marine, what they actually look like in terms of what their jobs have been, even if they were infantry or even if they were, you know. A hundred percent. But there's these qualities that happen, right? Like there's always that kid when it's like 31 degrees and raining, you know, it's got a smile on his face. Yeah. Right. There's something to be learned from that. And there's a benefit mm -hmm. in a lot of different environments, corporate or otherwise, that you'll want that kid, guy yeah. or girl, whoever it is, that, you know, positive attitude, resilience, right? Decent mm -hmm. judgment, like all of these things. They, they've been brought up or they know intuitively some of the things you've been talking about that now we're trying to bring ourselves to that level. Attitude, right? attitude how many times? Yeah. Attitude is everything. Yeah. Right, we heard that when we were privates. Mm -hmm. Keep yeah. a good attitude, smile, fake it till you got it, whatever yeah. it is. There's all science-driven things behind that. Yeah. Know? I mean, my God, my grandmother taught me 99% of what I needed to know. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you, your, uh, your fears, your stress are just thoughts. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Don't I mean, go to bed angry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take a walk when you're hot under the collar. Yeah. Like all these different Take things. a deep breath. Yeah. <laughs> Take a deep breath is the physiologic mm -hmm. sigh. And yeah. Andrew Huberman does an amazing spot on that. If you don't listen to the Huberman Lab, you should. It's amazing. But he talks about the physiologic. Yeah, you said Huberman that. Lab? Huberman Lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andrew Huberman out of Stanford, uh, uh, professor of ophthalmology at Stanford Medical School. Brilliant researcher, brilliant human being. And he's done so much in this wellness and resilience space by bringing sort of democratizing, digestible bits of information that people yeah. can implement into their lives. So, uh, you know, we've kept here almost three hours, but I, 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 I cut you off earlier when you, you were talking about down regulation because I wanted to sort of follow the chronology of your story. Sure. But you said that you had, at this point, you had already started looking at down regulation. But when did, I mean, was it a big, was it just a slow process for you uh, to start implementing it into your life or did... You know, at what point did it become a big focus of yours? Um, 2015. 2015. Give me a second. I want to make sure I'm accurate. This 2015, I came across a company out of Boston called Whoop. Uh, oh yeah, they make the yeah yeah. And um, one of the people there was kind enough to give me sort of a trial, and I started mm -hmm. seeing what they were reading about and started to dig up. Now, I've always geeked out, like the amount of knowledge in my head that I have no business having across topics that I will never tap into is really absurd. But I've always been someone who likes to consume yeah. and read and understand. Um, I think that's sort of an ADHD piece where it's like if I'm being stimulated, I feel a little, a little calmer. And uh, I went deep into like articles. And same thing I did when I was in medicine. Like when I was a registered nurse, I read everything that the red medical students and the residents were reading. When I was in a cardiothoracic ICU, I would read everything that they were reading because I never wanted to be the person in the room that didn't have the answer. And you don't have to be an MD to know the knowledge and answer the question. Any one of us are capable of reading a peer-reviewed journal. Right. And we could even assess it and say, like, it seems more solid than this one. I'm going to believe this one until I have two that say this. Right. Yeah. We can all do that. But for some reason, society, we believe like it has to be like an Instagram influencer yeah. with no qualification that right. endorses the idea. Right. right? So um, I started looking into heart rate variability and I was doing a lot of working out and riding and hiking. And I was trying to see like how I can affect my sleep. I was a terrible sleeper my entire life. And all of a sudden, I started finding these little correlations that happened between my sleep pattern and what I did during the day before or in the mornings of. And I started to discover for myself that the things that happened immediately after waking up were far more critical to my night's sleep than really? the things that I did right before and by far. And the wow. science is proving that out right now. First 90 minutes of your day actually is probably more critical to your sleep and your over well being than anything else. Really? Simple can you, things. Simple can you give things. an example? Uh, no caffeine for 90 minutes after waking up. Wow. Period. Full stop. I used to literally, if I could have had an espresso maker next uh, yeah. to my bed as my alarm that would shoot coffee into my open mouth, I would have done it, right? But um, it disrupts a natural biochemical process that allows for focus and calm to take place. Wow. Yeah. And uh, all you got to do is stay for 90 minutes and that afternoon crash that you get immediately goes away and you'll feel it on the first day that yeah. you do it. 
and then you'll say, well, that couldn't be, and then you'll do you, violate it. But you do it. have caffeine after that, do you? Yeah, because then it becomes a performance-enhancing drug versus a focus-inhibiting action. Interesting. You know, right? So something like that. Yeah. Bright light on your face within 15 minutes of waking up artificial or otherwise yeah. you'd be well well served to put one of these yeah. right in there whatever room you're getting ready in and have that if it's artificial light andrew huberman again says you need 15 to 30 minutes but bright light plays such an important role in setting the time of when you begin converting into that melatonin serotonin space and getting ready for your 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 drawdown in your sleep right gratitude okay gratitude needs to be practiced in a state of arousal you need to be thankful when you're feeling the feels and you're in this great space. And there is a biochemical process that takes place when you are grateful. And if you want to um, practice that, you can. What's more important and the thing we need to learn more about is forgiveness. Gratitude is something I do to you or do for you. I want to thank you both for letting me be here tonight. This is like therapy for me and I'm not bullshitting you. I'm being very serious. This is amazing for me right now and I'm so grateful. So I'm thanking you both to allow you to feel that and you both will down regulate but if i want to do that for myself well that starts with forgiveness for ourselves and for others how many things are there in our world that we carry with us pissed off about we just saw us go off on a diatribe about <laughs> army but breaking our heart every chance we get right is it yeah. time for steve to forgive army <laughs> you know army i understand i knew you tried to do right by me you had your own stuff going on, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. army was just doing the best army could army do. Army was doing the best they could. Army At had the their time. own issues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> seriously. So, <laughs> army had a tough childhood. So we go through these things, and there's so many of these different levers we could pull if we just make the space for it. But if we don't make the space for it as leaders, or parents, right, or siblings, or whatever it is, they're never going to be part of what's normal in our society. Okay. I'll give you a physiologic example. When you're in a state of hypervigilance, the energy demand, I'm simplifying this to the order that's going to be like, there will be endocrinologists actually slamming their face against the wall if they happen to overhear this explanation. But essentially, we have an energy demand that exceeds a consumption model when we are in a state of hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Everybody say you want to change your body fat composition, you have to sleep, right? Well, it's the sleeping, sure, but it's the sleeping, which is what? Part of a fast, but it's also the sleeping as a pillar of downregulation, okay? Yeah. But if you're in a state of hypervigilance, your energy demand is such is that you're going to begin catabolizing muscle, catabolizing muscle to use your energy. Glycogen is going to be produced by your liver through a process called gluconeogenesis. And then you're going to have an insulin insensitivity. If you want to solve the problem, and this is speculative and anecdotal, it's both of the things science shouldn't be. But I think if you want to change this onset of diabetes of the young or this high increase in body fat composition of our teenagers, I think we should take a look at downregulation and we should take a look at the elimination of social media because the numbers do not support that sports programs don't exist. The, the biological markers yeah. are not supported by, they're not exercising as much as they used to or climbing yeah. in trees. But it is supported that they're not outside, which we know is naturally down-regulated. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So until we start fixing these things, right? Because when you're catabolizing muscle and not burning body fat, you get a condition that we've all already heard the name for, that's skinny fat. That's this mm. shift that takes place where people lose 10 pounds of overall weight, but they increase their body fat right. by five yeah. and 10%, and then they have a type two diabetic picture. Mm. Right. The physiological piece of this is extraordinary. And until we start working on these things by pulling these levers that we can to live longer and live better and healthier, we're not going to solve the bigger problems. And those bigger problems of hypervigilance manifest themselves into suicide rate that we've all gotten the call on. Right. The divorce rate, the alcohol abuse. None of these things are going to go, and we're never going to get back to being good social drinkers of alcohol if we're in a state of hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. It's fascinating. We have that had a, a brilliant way to yeah, sum we, it up. Um, you know, you. we've had a lot of people. We've talked about post traumatic stress quite a bit on the show, and and we've, you know, we've talked to, you know, we've talked about stellate ganglion blocks. We've talked about plant based uh, sure. medicine. You know, um, 
we've talked about a lot of these things, but I think one of the things that we haven't really talked about up in this point, at least not deeply, is this idea, because I, I believe that all of those are, I think they're all good pattern interruptions and they're yeah. all, you know, they're all a good way to like give you that break. Uh, but, but also is there a way once you're past stellate ganglion blocks, once you're past like, yeah. hero doses of uh, psilocybin and, and things like that, it, it, are those continuous? Uh, is there a way yeah. to, to maintain once you interrupt that pattern? Yeah. Well, those are the habits you're talking about, right? The, the habits. The but I'll frame it another way. So let's imagine a world of proactive versus reactive. Uh -huh. What I would argue is the need for those interventions are few and far between. It's the difference between a yoga instructor and a um, nutritionist versus a psychiatrist, uh -huh. right? So I would say like step one, everyone that can be proactive and address it proactively should. Now, is that gonna eliminate all psychological trauma? Of course not. Mm -hmm. And a good, a, a, a horrible example of that that nobody wants to talk about is military sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. War zone rates are horrific, mm -hmm. right? And you have people in an upregulated state that then undergo a physical sexual trauma. They don't stand a chance. So the interventions that you talk about right there in a reactive setting are necessary and appropriate. Mm -hmm. And some people just because of a confluence of different events that come place where it's like, I'm not meditating or breathing my way out of this. I need a pro, I need some drugs, yeah. I need some guidance, I need a break in the pattern. Right. Yeah. And interrupt her. Yeah. But that should be the anomaly. Uh -huh. And I think most of this could be addressed proactively and sort of like, and I say institutionally or patternly or mm. whatever the right word is, like as a pattern where we implement these things into our lives. Like, you know, I use the example all the time in the OR where they do a timeout before first incision. Right. Right. Well, what about weapons clearing? Yeah. Right. Can we do breath work before and after both of those mm. events? Right. Right. Could you imagine? So what do we do? We get in a scrape overseas. We fire a bunch of bullets. People get wounded, whatever the thing that happens is. And then you go through and every army does some format of a lace report. Right. Right. Well, what is the emotional triage that we need to be doing? Mm. What if every time you went somewhere and were about to embark on something, I checked in with you for like um, your feelings? Just making it up, but a one to five score on technical competence, anxiety, sleep, and personal care. Mm -hmm. Right? And what if we checked in and you came in every morning? I was like, how are you doing today? Well, what do we say right now? We get this stupid double thumbs up living the dream right sarcastic annoying and it doesn't tell us anything right but what if i came in here and i said how you doing today and you say i'm about a four three three four and i know immediately where you are on the scale and what i can do to mm. assist why are you anxious i tried to call my wife this morning and i didn't get her she dropped the kids off at school and i really don't know where the hell she is and then i could say hey can you keep calling his wife or texting his wife until we get an okay and a thumbs up on her right and then somebody's on it so at least you know somebody's on it Right. While you're trying to perform whatever critical function is. Right. That would be extraordinary leadership. And that's my goal for this endeavor I'm on right now, to get to there, that level of honesty. Where, um, you know, I feel like we could go for a whole other hour. Like, where can people find you? Uh, you know, we, we talked about social media, but are you active there? Are you working on any, are, are you working on any publishing? So I've been approached a lot. Um, it's funny that you bring it up. I've, I've been approached for speaking and I've been approached for, um, a book. Um, you know, my commitment is to HSS and I, I speak, uh, in the industry a lot, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I think the message is important and whether that message is delivered to veterans or the general population, I don't think it matters. Everybody knows a veteran. The communities are so much more intertwined. Um, people could find me on LinkedIn, but I don't have any social media presence. Um, but people can find me at Steve Forty on LinkedIn. I'm the Chief Wellness Officer at HSS, and I encourage people to just to share knowledge or if they need a hand with anything, like anybody that knows right. me. I think those links too, Steve, are going to be really interesting for a lot of a lot of people. The Andrew Hubert, Huberman, yeah, Huberman. And then um, you mentioned one other. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, was it Seth? 
Yeah, Seth Hickerson. Hickerson. Um, I, I, he um, and I would have to. I'll check on the on the, on his company. You know, he was uh, a guy that did some great work with us early on, or is a guy that did some great work with us early on. I haven't worked with him over the past like year and a half, but I wanted to make sure I credited him when I brought up the um, emotional control routine thing. Um, but there's a lot, and and he has a a mind. Um, is it Steady Mind? Is that Steady his? Mind? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he has a, my my Steady Mind is his company. My Steady Mind. He works with uh, NASA, and there's a guy named Alex Rains out of Oklahoma uh, that works for his company, and uh, John McCaskill, who's a Navy SEAL, who's somebody you should consider having on the program. I'll even come back. He's a friend and an awesome guy, and uh, he works in that. Men, he has the Men Talking Mindfulness podcast. So I'll make sure I provide these resources, mm -hmm. but. You know, we got to get to a point where we're open to those. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that needs to happen in a lot of those instances is that people like you need to speak about them because so much of that, you know, you like you talked about yoga, so many of those things, even though we can look back at, you know, Buddhism, at, at, at mindful meditation, uh, Vipassana, you know, things like that. But then it went through this new age sort of, you know, where everything was presented through a new age lens, you know, in the United States. And nobody in the military wants to be tied to, you know, like, yeah. like the ideas, some of the ideas, no, whether the ideas themselves are are laughable or the way they're presented are laughable. Yeah. But, but if you share that sort of, you know, that marketing endeavor, right. The, cause new age is really just marketing. If you share that away and go back to a lot of the original sources and then add that to now, like what you say can be, uh, can be proven. Um, you know, we can look at things now. Yeah. Uh, and say, wow, like this stuff is real, 100%. you know. Um, and you know, one of the things you say about the way it's presented, it struck a chord with me because I know if this existed in the military back in the day, or even probably now, they'd be like, do push-ups until you downregulate. <laughs> you know, I'll keep yelling if you don't yeah. downregulate. Yeah. Like where it should down be. Downregulate yourself, yeah. private. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. I can, I can have, I can downregulate you all that. Yeah, you know. So I think that I think that's an important part of this where we recognize a different approach to these things and i think there needs to be a bit of an a la carte and you know like i'll give you a great example right no one talks about religion no one right it's somehow it's a third rail it doesn't really matter what the religion is but when we talk about like the certain premises of different religions across the board most religions have elements of forgiveness have elements of gratitude have mm -hmm. a code of conduct have a meditative component to it yeah, yeah. you know and i this, think part yeah. of what we're facing in society right now is an abandonment of that structure right yeah. so to provide all of these things if you have a religious propensity that's great encourage pursuing it if it needs to be yoga or taoism or buddhism or whatever that right. is or if it just needs to be self hypnosis or even if it needs to be crossfit properly supported people need to know there are levers for everyone to pull and they fall you pull the first one for me it was mm. sobriety and then into sleep hygiene and then into breath work okay. and i was actually yoga for about two years and all of these things went and you take these elements with you of what works and you literally can change your life with breath work and instead of running to the medication and instead of running to the pharmacologic intervention we do this right run a marathon Hey, everybody, I'm going to go run a marathon. I'm going to do a ultra marathon. Well, what was your 5K time? Well, no one's run a 5K because it's not heroic enough. And we think that breath work or sleep hygiene couldn't possibly fix our depression. Mm -hmm. Right. But study after study says it, it does. does. Yeah. I think that one of the benefits of some of the other interventions, whether, like I said, whether it's a stellate ganglion block or plant based or, or you know, what uh, some of these other things, is it. If you tell somebody in distress, you know, when they are in that place where nothing seems like it could get better and they're like, yeah, breathing. If they breathe for two or three days, like they may not. The The thing is, is it if you give them a break, if you if you give them an opportunity to see that. Yeah. That, like, you know, step outside that box or, or look through a window and see something different, then then they might be open to they give you the space to it reframe. gives you the space yeah. to yeah 
Remember we talked early mm -hmm. on about the assault on the senses yeah. that take place, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're in this state of this chronic upregulation, right. you're not even in the room. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So how do you create space where right. they can be in the room and they could be present enough? Right. Right. So sometimes breath work, even for that two or three minutes, will create that hopefulness, will create that space. And then you have something to build off of. You know, that's why I like teaching the tool. Right. Because if you teach the tool of resonant breathing, they're going to get anxious again, especially if they're in a bad state and especially if they have damn good reason to be loss right. of a loved one or rending of a relationship. But what do we teach now? Like, what is the if you were to ask a room full of people and I speak publicly about this? Yeah. And if I and nobody ever answers, honestly, but if I go to a room full of people and I is like, how do you deal with stress? Fifty percent of the people will say a glass of red. Yeah, which is the worst possible thing. And I'm not even yeah. on my soapbox about not drinking right, right now. But if you're talking about decreasing anxiety, then alcohol is literally an accelerant for that. Mm. Right. But we say it, we preach it, and it's often leaders that are stating it. Right. Instead of saying that's the last yeah. thing you need. Right. Right. So um, you're right, though. But there is a time for emergency intervention. There's a time for institutionalization. Like these things exist. And if you don't catch them soon enough or sometimes even when the, you know, elements of whatever the assault is hit at such a fever pitch that there's nothing but medical intervention and everything Will work is going to work. Right. It happens. Right. But it should It's an escalation of force. And you yeah. want to you want to use the. You want to use the pencil flare first before. Right. So have you, uh, or do you, uh, what are your dreams, I'll say? Mm -hmm. What are your dreams about bringing this to not just the veteran community, but the active duty military community? Yeah. Um, it requires a cultural shift, right? So there's been a bit of a renaissance because never nobody talked about sleep or sleep hygiene in 2006 and 2007, but they're talking about it now. And there's a lot of people doing good work in the space, okay? But there's two things. Here's my dream, okay? You want to solve the retention problem in the military? Well, you're going to need to solve the communication problem, which is a, a, a byproduct of hypervigilance. Right, you only need to crush a 21, 22 year old once once by saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, and that's in any industry. Right, and if whether you're Goldman or HSS or New York Press or the U.S. Army or the Coast Guard or law enforcement, whatever it is, nobody can afford those miscommunication opportunities where they say like, "How can you be so X, Y, and Z?" versus "Let's talk about how we got here." Mm -hmm. So we can't afford those anymore. We have a workforce that's depleted as it is. We can't retain the people we want in the military as we want to. So that's the institutional solution there. We need to figure out how to make this part of it. And that's going to require research and numbers, real research and real numbers. And I'm talking measuring data points. And if you say like the military and you analyze a unit, there's a million elements that AI is going to allow us to, to take a look at. But you take a look at frequency deployments. You can take about the ethnic composition of the of the force. You can talk about the sleep hygiene and the physical fitness piece. And all of these things will go in to make up with some predictive modeling over the stress. And when I say like the ethnic comp uh, composition, I bring that up. People are like, well, what do you? Well, what if you have a, a, a an individual that's a Muslim? who is first generation that's deploying to a war zone in a Muslim dominant country. Uh -huh. There's a different allostatic load on that individual and some considerations should probably be made before we deploy that person. Mm -hmm. This is all hypothetical. Yeah. Right. I'm saying right. just as any other thing might be. If we were at war with Canada and we had a Canadian with family yeah. members in Montreal, then they would feel that same tug. Mm -hmm. Right. So that my dream is that at an institutional level we start taking these things seriously and start mitigating these things institutionally mm -hmm. and that at an individual level we start equipping these people in the world all of them with the tools necessary so in the institutional level we make room for the mitigation of it and at an individual level we give them the training they need because we'd be more inclined to talk to them about a gym membership but we'd be better served to teach them meditation uh -huh. the iphone is something that should be thrown in the ocean and not the iPhone specifically, 
Right. But any cellular device should be tossed in the ocean. But if we're not, there are things like Headspace and the Calm app mm. and different things. Right. And uh, uh, there's another one. Um, I think it's called. There's one called Breathwork. Actually, it's great. okay. Yeah. Right. So, and I think there's another one called Reverie, which is self meditation app. These are good uses of that technology. So, if you're going to accrue some screen time, it should be screen time that down regulates us. Yeah. Up regulates us. Yeah. And th that's my dream. So, how do we get there? Well, I enjoy speaking about it, and I'd love to speak more publicly about it. It's not about compensation or anything like that. Just getting the message out and making whatever I got left in the world. Right. I'm 52. I hope it's a solid run. I think it'll be. I've taken pretty good care of myself, but we never know. But if I got 20, 25, 30 years left, we know that our lives don't exactly lead to longevity. Right. Right. But if you got X number of years left, well, what's my biggest achievement that I can make or what's the biggest impact? I think it would be addressing groups in a, in a large scale among these topics and, and helping them make space for it in their lives. It's fantastic. Steve, that, thanks so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. This is um, amazing. I'm going to, uh, so the 20 year war is like a coffee table book. It's fascinating. And it has the profiles of, I don't even know how many, you know, uh, veterans in it. And, uh, I think you're page 130. Steve, it happens to be, um, one of those veterans. Um, also Andy, let's plug your book oh, real quick too. Yeah. <laughs> because, you. you know, we talked about leadership and we, you know, empathic, like, um, uh, Soon to be out in paperback. Scooch over a little, Andy. Oh. You're right. Um, this is honestly oh. one of the best military books that I read because in it, a as a leader, like Andy, there's a lot of like self-reflection on like his choices as a leader and stuff like that, which I think is very human. Um, for any of your orthopedic surgical <laughs> needs, <laughs> yeah. A, uh, HSS, the Hospital for Specialized uh, Special Surgery, surgery yeah. Special Surgery, is like the best in the world. It is. It, with, with, I mean, without without equivocation, like with, it is numerous the best numerous mm -hmm. rating agencies. I think everyone places us at number one. We just got awarded number uh, one for Children's in the Tri-State area, which is saying something. Um, so if you if there's a musculoskeletal issue that you have more, going on. More knee replacements than any other hospital in the United States, which yeah. is a topic close to a lot of our hearts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, exactly. And the talent that yeah. you um, that is there at HSS Rivals. I mean, there's no, it's an extraordinary place, and I'm so grateful to be a part of it. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I forgot questions real quick. We'll, we'll breeze through these because I know we've kept you here super long, but I'm good. let me just... Uh, do, do you mind pulling up the Patreon questions? Or, or do you have it? Um, we really deeply appreciate your time, uh, your insight, your wisdom, your experience. Uh, here. So that's how that works. Behind the green curtain. Now. That's right. Hmm. That's our uh, saltwater tank, our Maybe Jack saltwater tank. Um, Luis Vasquez, thank you very much. Uh, how did your work in hospitals mentally prepare you for combat? Yeah, I think all of these things. I, I so I always think about that. Right? So um, I think sometimes that the mandatory age should be required for enlistment should be like twenty eight because I think there'd be a lot less post-traumatic stress because life has a way of inoculating you to some of the challenges. And I think that um, understanding the physiology and understanding the mechanical piece of the human body gave me a great deal of confidence in my ability to receive care or give care if it was needed. I think one of the things, and this is an important one, and this is anecdotal again, I think technical proficiency can be correlated or tactical proficiency can be correlated with post-traumatic stress. Purely anecdotal. But when you feel good about your job and you mm -hmm. feel competent about it, it just takes the edge off of that stress and that strain, decreases that allostatic load. And for me, um, being in a position to help others and having the skill and knowledge to medically help others made me feel a great sense of purpose, made me feel a good sense of belonging, and I think that is the way in which it helped um, prepare me. Things get a little bit less scary if you've seen some element of them before mm -hmm. 
Um, Joe's got you. Thank you very much. Uh, did you work a lot with SOT A's as being an 18 Fox? I did. Uh, and as an 18 Bravo. And I think it's an extraordinary um, line and profession. And um, we think of the cool guy stuff all the time, right? Mm -hmm. the, the lead slinger and the, the door kicker. Um, as we go to a more sort of quantified battlefield where like triggers are needed in order to action objectives mm -hmm. the number of triggers and the specificity at which technology can ex you know identify them and exploit them the importance of that skill set is just going up and up so to couple a skill set like that with the tactical competence is going to make you a very it's like the opposite of what i did i went into like weapons sergeant and found out after the fact that if i went in as a medic or a combo person you'd be infinitely more deployable. Well, I think the future deployability is career fields like that. Yeah, uh, and you know, we talked about 19th group, and now we're talking about Saudi, so I just want to give a shout out to uh, Gene Vance, uh, <laughs> you know, um, he passed away on in 2002. Um, anyway. Um, was that the, who stood up the West Virginia? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Cat Chaser, thank you for the donation and the sticker, a uh, cat sticker. Um, D, did you get that? All right, I'll, I'll pull it up real quick. Um, and Patreon. here okay oh wait those are messages sorry guys uh all right uh i uh oh we have a couple here um Hi, Steve. Uh, as someone with a rich background in fitness, health, and wellness, what do you think about the proposed changes of going back to the APFT? And also, do, what do you think about the Army's biggest challenge roadblock in regards to soldier fitness and physical readiness across the Army? All right. In reverse order, the biggest threat to national security, I think, right now is the inability for us to field a force. And when we get down to the number of people that are willing to serve and able to serve and capable of serving without felonies and drug issues and all of these different exclusions mm -hmm. that is the by far i think our biggest threat to national security and lowering the standard is never the answer the idea that we would go back to the apft right now or the original format of the apft is quite possibly the most hilarious thing that i've ever been disappointed with army about like we've been training in a different way and even if you're not going to go back to you know the army was it the ace the new army combat fitness test or acft or whatever it was that they changed to even if we didn't follow that by the letter and that has to morph we can't possibly think that push-ups and sit-ups and running is the entirety of the measure mm. of the lethality of, a, yeah. of an individual so i think it's both hysterical mm. and tragic yeah and i don't understand it goes back to this i remember when they've throughout history they've made these like wide sweeping legislative changes in the military and i'm all for change right i think it's a good idea but like when we we needed better body armor we're talking like 2002 2003 and there was a company called dragon skin that was out and they're like drop testing it and field testing it and nuking it and doing all this stuff for like i'm exaggerating and i'm sure my facts are somewhat wrong but it was like over the course of like five years that it still hadn't been fielded when they finally did like a 60 minute episode on it right and it still never got fielded yet they'll do a reversal like this without an ounce of study right and it's just and what i understand is it's an individual saying like we're going back to to the old way well this is what we did and it was fine for us yeah right yeah yeah okay here's your wool yeah and your musket yeah so um i think it's tragic um and i think i have no choice but to laugh about the absurdity of it if it's true and if it does go that way yeah 
it's just we injure soldiers we we release I think for the most part, every soldier that we get off active duty, whether it's at five years or 10 or 15 years, I'm not, I don't, I'm not certain that we're leaving them better, stronger, and more mobile than we found them. Right. And we have an obligation to, to do better than that. Um, Bill Gage. Hey, hey, Bill. Bill is a former guest. Um, love the show and, and the high side. Uh, keep it up. Question for Steve. Uh what are your thoughts on the future of the Green Beret? With so much emphasis on cybersecurity, will there always be a need for unconventional warfare? And do you ever see a war like the uh, Do you ever see a war like the early days of Afghanistan that was cyber only? Example: defeating an adversary with cyber only, like SF did with embedded preci uh, teams precision mm -hmm. bombing. Um, no idea, but I do know that. Um, What's the old saying that when they said like with the nuclear bomb, they was like, how how's the next war going to be fought? And they with said with the nuclear, stones. but yeah. the one after yeah. that will be sticks and stones. Yeah. Um, I don't think the need for individuals on the ground is ever going to go away. I think that um, clandestine is going to be a thing of the past. I think field craft is going away. Uh, when AI can analyze gate more accurately when we can currently mm. analyze a fingerprint, it's going to make any type of field craft really obsolete. Obsolete, and I think that the only domain where um, there's going to be a new kind of grit in the cyberspace. Mm. I really believe that there's going to be a new kind of gritty and scrappiness. And I know that sounds silly, but like I think that's what the future of special operations and it's the new domain. And why would you? you know, blow up a bridge to prohibit trucks from going over it when you can reallocate trucks that yeah. are moving on the roads to right. a different location or shut the refrigeration units off of them without an alarm notifying the owners of the trucks that the alarm is off and the spoilage occurs. Right. There's so many ways uh, for sabotage. W what we're seeing in Ukraine kinetically is is tip of the iceberg. I mean, cyber war. Um, what the Ukrainians are doing, and I do hope they talk about it afterwards, because it plays right into what you're saying. Really, and I have no visibility on that, but it, it, it just right. it seems intuitive to me. When you could shut off water supplies yeah. or natural gas, like I'm, I'm so vulnerable right now. You yeah. know, I got yeah. natural gas piped yeah. to my house. I got electricity that runs that I don't even know where it's generated or how it's generated. Right, right. You know. Uh, Dear Mr. Forty, um, I'm 30 years old, majoring in cybersecurity, and a while ago I tried to enlist in the Army, but wasn't qualified. Uh, if I got in, I would have gone with Cyber, then try out for SF Intel, certain like you. Is there any way I can still get to do what you did? Uh, like what PMC or private Intel agencies should I apply to after I get my bachelor's so that I can still somehow live my dream? Let's not grow. <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. What I would say is, you said you didn't get in, and I don't know if that was. An I, I think it was medical. Uh, okay, it was medical disqualification, if yeah. I if I remember right. Um, well, if it's orthopedic, hit me up on LinkedIn. There you go. Um, but um, I don't know on the civilian side. I would say that um, they are going to have to. I'll tell you what. They are going to have to make physical accommodations for this the technical aspects of jobs. Yeah. You know, and it's the same thing. Like if they're going to require. Mm -hmm these soft skills that truly the, the, there's this fundamental idea that everyone has to be a gunslinger right and that served the marine corps and the military really well because chances are if you were forward, forward deployed in you know western europe in the 40s you might end up having to engage right. regardless of what your job was that's changing right now we have guys operating and gals operating drones from all sorts of areas right. in the world so I think that the military is going to begin laxing on those physical standards. So make sure you got a hard, good answer on that. And I wouldn't give up pursuing it. And I know plenty of people that push and press for a waiver and get them over time. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things we're seeing people with this amazing talent, you know, uh, in cybersecurity. Yep. But a lot of them have that amazing talent because they weren't outside playing a ton or, yeah. you know, competing in in sports. They were, you know, honing their craft. Exactly. And and there has to be there has to be a real, you know, 
a, a real uh, answer to that other than just, well, this is the military. You're a soldier you're, first. Yeah, you're, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, so that's it. That's our show. We deeply appreciate everybody. We really appreciate you being here. Great to be here. Um, who do we have n next week, D? Mark Polymeropoulos next Friday or next Tuesday? Next Friday. Next Friday. Uh, Mark Um I'll be back. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah he'll uh, be here because gonna... Jack will still have the light sleeper out in uh, in the hinterlands. Yeah, I've of... got Jack's yeah. apartment. You know. <laughs> That's right. All right, everybody, please like and subscribe. Join our Patreon if you haven't already. Just $5 a month mm -hmm. can help keep our lights on. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thank all, you. All, Steve. Yeah. I really was.